You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Papel. As the nauseating stench came filtering out, we all fell back to the mouth of the cave, where there was clean air. Today's offering was quite the undertaking, folks. The Tomb of the Old Ones, by the British author Colin Wilson, first appeared in the 1999 Chaosium publication, The Antarctos Cycle, and we're thrilled to present the first ever audio recording of it. In Antarctica, a major archaeological discovery is about to be made. See the video description for chapter times. Artwork by the great Vishnu Prasad. And without further ado... The Tomb of the Old Ones, by Colin Wilson 1. It is a strange thought that most human beings imagine they possess free will, and yet that the most important events in their lives may be determined long before they were born. My own story is a case in point, for the genesis of the most important event in my life occurred fifty years before my birth, even to falling on the date of my birthday. On April 19, 1930, my great-grandfather Daniel Willoughby, at that time President of the Geographical Society of Winchester, Virginia, introduced as guest speaker the famous polar explorer Admiral Richard E. Byrd. In the previous November, Admiral Byrd and his three companions were the first men to fly over the South Pole. Bird had already been the first man to fly over the North Pole in May 1926. Winchester, where I was born, was also the birthplace of Admiral Bird, who often returned there to see his family. Before the lecture, my great-grandfather took him to dinner, and later they returned to his house for a late-night drink. It was then that my great-grandfather— fortified by a large glass of bootleg brandy imported from Canada, summoned the courage to ask the great explorer about a rumour that had been confided to him by the last guest speaker, whether it was true that Bird had flown over an immense hollow where the South Pole should be, in which he had seen green hills and lakes. According to my great-grandfather, Bird looked grave, stared into his glass for a long time, then said, To be honest, Dan, I'm not in a position to confirm it or deny it. At that moment they were joined by my great-grandmother, who brought in the coffee. Whether Bird would have said any more is a matter for conjecture, but in any case they now changed the subject. Understandably, my great-grandfather took the comment as an admission that Bird had seen something that he was not allowed to talk about. After all, if he had seen nothing but snow and ice, he would simply have said no. Bird was a good-natured, kindly man, full of consideration for others, and this was undoubtedly why he answered my great-grandfather, instead of refusing to comment. When my great-grandfather told his wife at breakfast the following morning, my grandfather, also called Daniel, happened to be next door, in the kitchen, and heard every word— he went off to school in a state of wild excitement. As he understood it, Admiral Byrd had confirmed that there was a vast hollow at the South Pole, full of mountains, green vegetation, lakes, and rivers. That could only mean one thing, that the earth was hollow. At school that day, he told several school friends. As soon as he got home, he asked his mother about it. To his astonishment and disappointment, she made light of it, claiming that the Admiral had simply meant that he had been unable to see the pole through the clouds. Yet she obviously told his father, for later that evening Dan Sr. reprimanded his son for eavesdropping, then told him not to repeat what he had heard. To my grandfather, this only confirmed that there was some tremendous secret— that night he had an exceptionally vivid dream. He was to tell me years later 
that he had always been subject to unusual dreams. He was in an airplane with Admiral Byrd, and they were flying over a snow-covered landscape. Then, suddenly, they were looking into a kind of immense volcano, in the centre of which there was a deep blue lake. Then my grandfather was alone, standing on the rim of the caldera, looking down at the magically brilliant landscape, in which the grass and trees were greener than any in the real world. The odd thing was that he knew he was lying in bed in his own bedroom, but that as long as he kept his eyes closed, he could go on looking at the land inside the volcano. He could actually feel the solidified lava under his feet, and see a flock of strange yellow birds that rose from the trees. Then he opened his eyes, and was back in his own room. He had experienced what is now called a lucid dream, and when he woke up could still recall the landscape as if he had actually seen it. Naturally, he was filled with feverish curiosity, and he read all he could find on the subject of Antarctica. In fact, over the years he became something of an expert on the continent, even delivering a lecture on its history to the Winchester Geographical Society, when he was still a college student. Admiral Byrd's son attended this lecture, but my grandfather was too shy to raise the subject of the hole in the South Pole. In 1949, my grandfather, now a married man and a lecturer in applied mathematics at the University of New Hampshire, was excited by a piece of news that he read in the New York Times. In that year, an Antarctic expedition mounted by Norway, Sweden, and Britain had taken sonar soundings through the ice around the coast of Queen Maudland, which in places was a mile thick and discovered bays that had been frozen over for thousands of years. Although my grandfather had long ago ceased to believe in the great hole at the South Pole, he was thrilled to realize that modern science could now look below the ice. As he later explained to me, some instinct told him that there was something important buried beneath the ice, and that it would be one day uncovered. He went to the trouble of obtaining copies of all the reports of the exploration team, and having them bound. My grandfather entered into correspondence with Dr. G. H. Wilby, the American team's sonar expert, as a result of which he was invited to write an article for the National Geographic magazine, and then for a number of other journals. His name became known as an expert on the Antarctic. There is an amusing story of how my grandfather came to marry. At a faculty cocktail party, he met a shy, brown-haired girl, and in the course of the conversation, asked her whether she would prefer to spend her honeymoon at Niagara Falls or the South Pole. He was surprised and delighted when she answered promptly, at the South Pole. Less than a year later, this is precisely where they did spend their honeymoon. The pair were subsequently to visit Antarctica many times, treating it as a holiday destination in much the same way that other families treat the Adirondacks or Atlantic City. In 1954, my grandfather was appointed to a committee to coordinate planning for the International Geophysical Year, which would take place in 1957-58. It was to have a twofold emphasis, on the study of outer space and on the continent of Antarctica. My grandfather was on the Committee for Antarctica, and a fellow committee member was George Wilby. Now came what is, I suppose, one of the major turning points in this story. In August 1956, my grandfather was asked to take part in a radio discussion of a controversial new discovery, the so-called Peary Race Map. Most of my readers will know about the map, so I shall offer only a brief summary. Earlier that year, a Turkish naval officer had presented the U.S. Navy Hydrographic Office with a copy of a map, whose original had been found in the Topkapı Palace in Istanbul in 1929. It was painted on parchment, and dated 1513, and showed the Atlantic Ocean, with a small part of the coast of Africa on the right, and the whole coast of South America on the left. At the bottom of the map was what looked like Antarctica. The map was passed on to the Hydrographic Office's cartographic expert, W. I. Walters, 
who in turn had shown it to a friend named Captain Arlington H. Mallory, who studied old Viking maps. It was after he had studied the map at home that Mallory made the astonishing statement that he believed it showed the coast of Antarctica as it had been before it was covered by thick ice. It appeared to show certain bays in Queen Maudland as they had been before they were frozen over. Now, a few days before the broadcast, my grandfather had received a copy of the Piri Rice map from the producer of the program. He compared it with the reports of the 1949 expedition, and was thrilled to discover that the bays corresponded exactly. It was amazing enough that a 16th century map should show Antarctica, which had not been discovered until 1820, but that it should show Antarctica as it had been in prehistoric times seemed preposterous. In the discussion, which took place at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., indignant scholars had said as much, and my grandfather then assured them that, as far as he could see, the bays on the Piri Rice map seemed to correspond to bays discovered under the ice in 1949. I must be honest and admit that my grandfather did not press the point. He was an academic, and had no wish to be thought a crank, but he certainly threw his authority on the side of the map and Captain Mallory. The discussion was lively, and was widely reported in the newspapers. My grandfather liked Mallory, who was a scholarly and friendly man. They had dinner together after the broadcast, and my grandfather had told Mallory a story about Admiral Byrd, and how this had stimulated his interest in Antarctica. Mallory told my grandfather that maps like the Piri Rice map were by no means uncommon. They were called portolans, which means from port to port, and they were used by mariners in the Middle Ages. The Library of Congress apparently had dozens of them. A few months later, Mallory contacted my grandfather to tell him that he had been in touch with another academic who was interested in the Piri Rice map a professor of the history of science called Charles Hapgood, who taught at Keene State College, fifty miles or so from the University of New Hampshire in Durham. He gave my grandfather Hapgood's phone number, and the two of them spoke on the telephone the same evening. They agreed to keep in touch and share their results. It was some time later that Hapgood rang my grandfather in a state of great excitement. He had spent several days at the Library of Congress, where he had been to study Portolans. He expected to see half a dozen or so. Instead, he found that the librarian had laid out a whole room full of them. There were dozens, probably hundreds. They appeared to show that these medieval mariners knew far more about the geography of the world than is generally supposed. Moreover, said Hapgood, he had discovered a map that undoubtedly showed the whole of Antarctica, as if photographed from the air. The map had been drawn by a map-maker called Orontius Phineas in 1531, and showed ranges of coastal mountains that are now deep under the ice. Hapgood was in the process of studying this map, but his preliminary findings indicated that the rivers on it followed natural drainage patterns, which meant that the coasts were then ice-free. Inland there were no rivers or mountains, suggesting that they were covered with ice. We know that at the end of the last ice age, around 11,000 BC, Antarctica spent thousands of years free of ice. Then, about 4,000 BC, the ice sheets began to return. That seemed to date the map, or the original map on which it was based, around 4,000 BC. Then why, asked my grandfather, were these amazing maps not better known, at least among scholars? That, said Hapgood, was precisely the question he had asked. The answer appeared to be that no one really cared. They were just a lot of old maps, drawn in the days when one mapmaker showed England looking like a teapot. A few days later, Hapgood and my grandfather met for dinner, choosing Manchester as a convenient midpoint. They took an immediate liking to one another, and spent the whole evening talking about Portolans. Why, asked my grandfather, did Hapgood not organize his students to make the first complete study of Portolans? That, said Hapgood, is just what I intend to do. 
On that evening, Hapgood told my grandfather more exciting news. In the Atlas by Gerard Kremer, better known as Mercator of 1569, there were several maps that showed Antarctica, including many features that had been discovered in recent years, such as Cape Dart and Cape Herlacher, the Amundsen Sea, Thurston Island, the Fletcher Islands, the Weddell Sea, and the regular range in Queen Maudland, which was shown as a series of islands. All this left no doubt whatever that Mercator had based his maps on several older maps, not just those of Piri Rice and Barontius Phineas. My grandfather told me later that although he drank no wine that evening, he felt as light-headed as if he were drunk. It seemed to these two respectable academics that they were discussing ideas that would change the history of the world. After all, this proved beyond all possible doubt that Antarctica had been known for centuries, perhaps thousands of years, before it was discovered by Edward Bransfield and others in 1820. All this obviously had tremendous implications. According to the historians, civilization began in the Middle East about 9000 BC, with the first farmers and the earliest cities. It took more than 5,000 years to develop into the great cities of Sumer and Akkad, where writing was invented. Yet, according to Hapgood, Antarctica was inhabited more than 6,000 years ago by men who sailed the seven seas and made maps. And a map would be no use without writing. Hapgood was saying that civilization is far, far older than we think. My grandfather noted in his diary that when he left Hapgood that night, he could not sleep. If Hapgood was correct, it would change the history of civilization. The sensation would be tremendous, and Hapgood would certainly become one of the most famous academics of his generation. Not long after that first meeting, when Hapgood spent a weekend with my grandfather at his home in Durham, he brought the most exciting news so far. He had discovered yet another map, this time by a Frenchman called Philippe Bush, dated 1737. This showed Antarctica divided into two islands, as it was before the ice came. Inland, there were rivers and mountains. This map seemed to have been made in the days when the whole of Antarctica was free of ice. This could surely only mean one thing, that the mapmakers lived in Antarctica— for why should sailors bother to go a thousand miles inland to map the interior, even if they could then sail to the South Pole? There could be no possible doubt. The maps demonstrated that in the days before civilization began in the Middle East, there was a worldwide seagoing civilization that sailed as far as Russia and China, which were shown on other ancient maps. This also meant, of course, that there must be evidence of ancient cities beneath the ice. Imagine, for example, what would have happened if ancient Athens or Rome or Ephesus had been buried under a blanket of snow and ice. Two thousand years later, their major monuments would still be perfectly preserved. The Parthenon and the Colosseum and the Arcadian Way would look exactly as they had when the ice came. And even under a mile of ice— Sonar would still show traces of their outlines. This is why my grandfather decided to persuade the Committee for the Geophysical Year to authorize sonar soundings all over Antarctica, inland as well as the coastal regions. A week later, he attended a meeting of his committee in Rome. He flew there with George Wilby. Before he left, my grandfather had come to a decision. If Wilby raised the subject of the broadcast— or the Peary Rice controversy, my grandfather would take him into his confidence about Hapgood and the ancient maritime civilization, and ask his help in persuading the committee to authorize sonar soundings. But if Wilby knew nothing about the broadcast or the map, my grandfather would keep silent. After all, Wilby was a scientist, not a historian. He might well feel pangs of conscience about trying to persuade the committee to spend money on an idea that might turn out to be nothing more than wild speculation. My grandfather liked him too much to want to embarrass him. 
Of course, there was no question of telling the committee about the real reason. To begin with, they might think him hopelessly eccentric and unreliable. But there was also the fact that he had no right to talk about Hapgood's ideas before Hapgood was ready to publish them. It would only undermine their impact when they were finally made public. In fact, it turned out that Wilby knew nothing of the broadcast and the Peary Rice controversy. But his help was unnecessary in persuading the committee. After all, ninety-five per cent of Antarctica is under a thick sheet of ice. It was only common sense to take sonar soundings to learn about the underlying geographical features. The proposal was passed without a dissenting voice. The IGY, International Geophysical Year, began in July 1957. Since this is midwinter in the Southern Hemisphere, the physical surveys in the Antarctic began after the September equinox, when, of course, it becomes perpetual daylight. This time, the Russians and the Japanese conducted surveys in Queen Maudland. The American team, organized by my grandfather and Wilby, were in the south, based at Byrd, while a second American team was based at Seipel in West Antarctica, near the Ron Ice Shelf. My grandfather told me that those first two months in Antarctica were the happiest of his life. In fact, his journals show that he felt as if he were on the brink of a great discovery— that would astonish the world. This was because of something he had learned only hours before he left, in late September 1957. He had spent the previous weekend with Hapgood at Keene State and looked at his latest findings. The more Hapgood studied the old Portolans, the more convinced he became that the original maps proved the existence of a great civilization long before the beginnings of Middle Eastern civilization in the land of the two rivers and his students had found the one piece of evidence whose implications were staggering. A map is, of course, a distortion of what it represents, because the earth is a sphere, and a map is flat. It was Mercator who found the most convenient solution to that problem, when he divided the earth's surface into latitude and longitude, and then projected it onto a flat surface. The old mapmakers used a simpler method— they chose some town as a convenient centre, then drew a circle around it and subdivided this into sixteen segments, like cutting a cake into sixteen slices. Along the outer edge of every slice, they drew various squares, and went on like this for as far as they needed to go. It was easy to see that the original centre of the Peary race map was off the map. A friend of Hapgood's, a mathematician at MIT— had calculated that this centre had to be in Egypt. This seemed to make sense, for the great library of Alexandria was in Egypt, and Hapgood had already decided that many of the original maps must have been in the library of Alexandria in the days before it was destroyed. But more calculation revealed that the centre of the Piri race map was not Alexandria, but a spot five hundred miles further south, a small town called Syene, which is modern Aswan. Why should the old mapmakers choose Syene as the centre of their maps? Hapgood thought he knew the answer. About 240 BC, a Greek called Eratosthenes had used a well in Syene to work out the size of the earth. He knew that at midday on June 21, the sun was reflected in the water of the well, and so must be directly overhead. That meant that objects in Syene cast no shadow. All Eratosthenes had to do was to measure the length of the shadow of a tower in Alexandria at midday on June 21, and calculate the angle of the sun's rays, which proved to be 7.5 degrees. Since he knew that Syene was 500 miles from Alexandria, he was able to work out the size of the earth by multiplying 500 by 48 the number of times 7.5 degrees goes into 360. He came up with the amazingly accurate figure of 24,000 miles, which is very nearly the correct length of the equator. But my grandfather pointed out an error in Hapgood's reasoning. If the original maps had been made thousands of years before Eratosthenes, then it was unlikely that the mapmakers had Eratosthenes in mind. Just before he left for the Antarctic, 
My grandfather spent an hour in the university library, and learned that Syene had another significance. It was at the same location as the island of Elephantine on the Nile, and the ancient Egyptians regarded it as the southern limit of their country. Since they measured Egypt upside down, and regarded the south as Upper Egypt and the north as Lower Egypt, Syene had the same significance for ancient Egyptian geographers that Greenwich has for modern ones. It was, in a sense, the most important place in Egypt. My grandfather had tried to telephone Hapgood before he left, but had been unable to reach him. Throughout the plane journey to the Antarctic, he brooded on the significance of what he had discovered. If the ancient Egyptians regarded Elephantine as one of the most important places in Egypt, and the ancient mapmakers had used it as their centre, it argued that there must be some connection between the maritime civilization of Antarctica and ancient Egypt. Of course, that was mere common sense if Antarctica was the home of a worldwide maritime civilization. You would expect its sailors to know ancient Egypt. Except, of course, that Egyptian civilization is supposed to have started about 3000 BC, when Antarctica was already covered with an ice sheet. If there was a connection between ancient Egypt and the Antarctic civilization, then Egyptian civilization must be far older than historians believe. As he sat on the plain and reflected on these incredible speculations, my grandfather felt almost physically dizzy. As far as he could see, Hapgood had proved that Antarctica was the home of a civilization that was thousands of years older than anything known to historians or archaeologists. Now it looked as if he had also proved, quite unintentionally, that the civilization of ancient Egypt was also thousands of years older than anyone believed. This theory was going to explode like a bomb in the academic world. If he, by some incredible piece of luck, could find evidence of an ancient civilization under the Antarctic ice, the theory would be virtually proved. They had flown through a day and night, and it was an hour after dawn when they sighted the coast of Queen Maudland. This was the seventh time my grandfather had visited Antarctica, but this time he saw it in a new way. Now he was looking at it as the home of a lost civilization, whose bays, now invisible under the ice, had once been crowded with sailing ships. As he gazed down at the ice that reflected the morning sun like a mirror, he told me that he experienced such an agony of curiosity that he said aloud, If only I knew! Then, exhausted by excitement, and also by the sheer length of the plane journey in a propeller-driven transport plane, he fell into an uneasy sleep. Sometime during those last few hours of the journey, he had another lucid dream. It was, he wrote, as if some invisible agency had decided to answer his prayer. In his dream, the plane was flying over an immense green continent, with lakes and forests and mountains. The dream was so clear that he was able to focus on the unfolding scenery. As in all lucid dreams, he was aware that this was a dream, and that he would soon be awake. What he now longed was to see some sign of life, or, better still, some kind of human settlement. With desperate urgency, he wanted to know what kind of people had lived in this lost continent nine thousand years earlier. At this point, his dream turned into a kind of phantasmagoria. He was no longer in the air, but on the ground surrounded by forest. The trees were conifers, and they were immense, like the columns of some Egyptian temple. Underfoot, the ground was wet, covered with some bright green moss that squelched as he walked. The air was oddly warm, unpleasantly warm like a steam bath, and it smelt of sulphur. He had a very strong and clear sense that he was about to meet the inhabitants of this strange land. At that point, one of those dreamlike transformations took place. He had become one of the inhabitants he was searching for, but it was not human. It was a kind of mass of tentacles, like an octopus, swaying as slowly and gently as seaweed in a current. 
or the tentacles around the mouth of a sea anemone. Yet he knew he was not under water. He was in a warm, stifling atmosphere that smelt of sulphur and decaying vegetation. This was not a nightmare. He told me that he experienced no sense of fear. He felt he was being given the answer to his question. The only trouble was that the answer was incomprehensible. Now, as in his childhood dream of Antarctica, he became aware that he was asleep. He could hear the engines of the plane, and feel the pressure of his seat. There was a sense in which he was wide awake. Yet, as he continued to keep his eyes closed, he continued to feel identified with the swaying tentacles. He told me that he sat there for perhaps five minutes, absorbed in this strange sensation of being another creature, a timeless creature that had existed for thousands, perhaps millions of years. As soon as he opened his eyes, the octopus disappeared, and he was himself again. For the remaining hour of flight, he reflected on what had happened. He was certain that it could not be dismissed as a dream. Yet what did it mean? Was it some curious hallucination conjured up by his unconscious mind in response to the urgency of his question? If so, why did it seem so oddly real? And if it was Antarctica that he had seen, why was it covered in enormous trees, trees the size of the giant redwoods of North America? He was still as puzzled as ever when the plane landed at the bird airstrip. Although the sun was dazzling on the snow, the pilot warned them that the temperature outside was well below zero. Wilby was there to meet him, dressed in furs that made him look like a polar bear. As they shook hands, my grandfather knew that he had to take Wilby into his confidence about Hapgood and the Portolans. That same evening, over dinner, my grandfather told him the whole story, beginning with the Washington broadcast, and confessed his real reason for wanting to take sonar soundings through the inland ice sheet. To his relief, Wilby found it all as fascinating as he did, but he pointed out that their chance of finding ancient cities under the ice was remote. If they existed, they would be more likely to be in the coastal regions, particularly in bays and inlets, where harbours could be constructed. So they got out their huge map of Antarctica, provided by the U.S. government, and spread it out over the tabletop. Where would an ancient civilization build a major port? The most obvious place was at the foot of the Beardmore Glacier, for that was once the point where a great river at once flowed into the sea. But this area was already being covered by the New Zealand team. Their own team would be working mainly inland. My grandfather pointed out that the Philippe Borsch map suggested that the civilization of Antarctica also extended inland. Otherwise, why bother to map it? Now, if the Ice Age took a thousand years to arrive, the inhabitants of Antarctica would have chosen sheltered places. You would not expect to find the remains of a city on the Rockefeller Plateau or the Hollick Canyon Plateau. Since the prevailing winds blow from the west, you might expect to find a city under the brow of a mountain, or the shelter of a plateau. They marked out on the map the area assigned to their team. It covered about 30,000 square miles between the Bird Research Station and the Ross Ice Sheet. In those days, most of this area was unmapped. Wilby had already decided that the best place to set up a base camp would be about 200 miles southeast of Bird in the area now called the Robertson Plain, sheltered from the prevailing west winds, which have been known to reach more than a hundred miles an hour by Holyoke Peak. As my grandfather studied the map, he saw that Wilby had also chosen the best place to search for signs of a lost civilization. Between Holyoke Peak and Mount Jerome, there is a valley that runs southwest toward the Dotson Ice Shelf, clearly a river valley. It is a place to avoid— because of the winds that are funneled down from the Amundsen Sea. The team would christen it Windy Gap. But in the days before the ice, it would have been an obvious place to choose for an inland city. The width of the valley 
suggested that it had once held a river that was both wide and deep, ideal transport for a nation of seafarers. They saw the actual site for the first time a week later, on October 9, when their seven-man team arrived with dog sleds. Wilby was waiting for them. He had gone ahead by helicopter with the team that had constructed their living quarters. That afternoon, while the technicians tested their equipment, Wilby and my grandfather trudged two miles through the hard-packed snow until Mount Holyoke ceased to protect them, and they were struck by the icy wind from the southwest. Behind them stretched the Robertson Plain, with Foray Peak visible in the distance. It certainly seemed an unlikely place to look for a lost city, but Wilby pointed out that it was less unlikely than it looked. At present, Mount Holyoke ended in a forty-five-degree slope, and as soon as they were beyond its protection, they were almost blown off their feet by the wind. In the days when Antarctica was green, the valley floor was perhaps half a mile below their feet, and the mountains probably descended into foothills that would have afforded shelter. Their first sonar sounding showed that Wilby was correct. There were foothills at the base of the southern slope of Mount Holyoke, and the main one stretched like the foot of some gigantic three-toed saurian toward the river. Its southern lee would have been ideal for a settlement, but the sonar revealed no traces that might have been the remains of buildings. I have said that my grandfather regarded those first two months in Antarctica as the happiest of his life. His journal describes how he woke every morning with a wonderful sense of excitement and optimism, the feeling that this is going to be the day. Yet when he climbed into his sleeping bag in the evening, after sixteen hours of utterly routine surveying, he felt no disappointment, only the same curious sense of euphoria the feeling that something wonderful and exciting lay in store the next day. In fact, from the point of view of topography, the Robertson Plain was disappointing. They had hoped to find interesting geographical features that could be mapped, but the land below the ice seemed as flat as its surface. It is now an established fact that the ice in Antarctica follows the contours of the underlying land, but in 1957 this was still unknown. But there would have been no time to feel discouraged. They were busy from morning till night. On some days they travelled as much as fifty miles with the dog teams, then set up camp overnight, in tents whose basic design was the same as those used by Scott and de Munson, and moved on again the next day. I have a photograph of my grandfather and George Wilby outside the hut they shared below Mount Holyoke. The photographer is standing with his back to the mountains, and behind the men stretches an endless flat expanse of snow, looking as bleak and dreary as the Midwest on a dull winter day. My grandfather would tell me, forty years later, that when the photograph was taken, he was reflecting on the fact that the secrets of an unknown civilization lay under more than half a mile of ice. He said he often found himself thinking how wonderful it would be if a sudden change in the earth's climate melted away the ice, until he remembered that ninety per cent of the world's ice is locked up in Antarctica, and that if it should melt, the sea level would rise by two hundred feet enough to submerge half the populated areas and drown most of the great coastal cities, including New York, London, Tokyo, and Amsterdam. The journal records that the team spent that Christmas in the township of Little America on the Ross Ice Shelf, and ate turkey and Christmas pudding, and drank rum punch. On Christmas morning, they were all invited to make telephone calls to their homes at the expense of the U.S. government. After exchanging greetings with his wife and children, my grandfather rang Hapgood. Merry Christmas, Charles. Anything new? Not a lot. We make steady progress. How about you? Have you found anything interesting? Afraid not. He summarized the result of their sonar findings. My own feeling is that if there was a pre-Ice Age civilization, it's probably left very few traces behind. Hapgood said, Oh, I don't know. Look at those descriptions in Plato. Huge palaces built from stone blocks, 
They wouldn't disappear in a hurry. My grandfather had lost the thread of the conversation. Plato? What has Plato to do with it? Don't you remember the description of Atlantis in the Critias? That's supposed to be before 9000 BC. My grandfather had never read Plato, but he had read about Atlantis as a child. But wasn't that supposed to be in the North Atlantic? Plato just says it was beyond the Pillars of Hercules, Gibraltar. That's a long way from Antarctica. Of course, but there was a time when Antarctica was closer to the equator. In fact, there's evidence that it was once on the equator. Are you sure? Haven't you read my book, Earth Shifting Crust? No. I'll send you a copy. It has an introduction by Einstein. I argue that the surface of the earth is like the skin on gravy. It can be pulled around. There's evidence that seventeen thousand years ago, Antarctica was thousands of miles further north. My grandfather asked incredulously, You're not suggesting— Hapgood said quickly, I'm not suggesting anything. Look, it's too complicated to discuss over the phone. We'll talk about it later. Then it was time to end the conversation. There were still a dozen people waiting to use the phone. As he hung up, my grandfather felt utterly baffled and frustrated. For the first time since he had been in Antarctica, he wished he was back home, back in Hapgood's study at Keene State, where he could ask him what on earth he was talking about. Outside, he met Wilby. Do you know anything about Atlantis? Only what everybody knows. Why? Oh, uh, I think Hapgood's gone mad. He seems to think Antarctica was once at the equator. So it was. But that was millions of years ago, when there was only a single continent called Pangaea. But what has that to do with Atlantis? I'm damned if I know. Do you know if there's a library in this place? Mm, a small one. It's in the hut next to the quartermasters. You won't find much there. Wilby was right. The library consisted mainly of detective fiction. But there was a college paperback called Ten Dialogues of Plato, and it contained the dialogue he was looking for, the Critias. He took it back to his quarters, and read it in less than an hour. It is only a fragment. Critias describes to Socrates how there was a great war nine thousand years earlier, between those who dwelt within the pillars of Hercules, and those who dwelt without. Those who dwelt without were the inhabitants of the island of Atlantis, bigger than Libya and Asia put together. Critias explains that his grandfather heard the story from the statesman Solon, who had heard it from the priests in Egypt. His description of the city and harbour of Atlantis is incredibly detailed. Plato makes it sound as massive as the Acropolis of Athens. When my grandfather had finished it, he was as confused as ever. Why had Hapgood mentioned Atlantis? Was he suggesting that the inhabitants of Atlantis, which had been destroyed by earthquakes and engulfed by the ocean, had fled to Antarctica? He felt he had to speak of it to someone, otherwise he felt his head would explode. Yet, as he was about to sit up and leave the room, he was overcome by unexpected drowsiness. He closed his eyes and fell asleep. Once again he experienced a curiously vivid and realistic dream. He was back at the base camp below Mount Holyoke, but there was no ice, and the atmosphere was almost tropically warm. The Robertson Plain was covered in lush grass, and he could see many trees. He turned north and began walking in the direction of Windy Gap, as he and Wilby had on their first afternoon there. On his left, he could see the three outcrops of rock that looked like the foot of a three-toed saurian. Then, suddenly, he was aware that he was looking at the Robertson Plain as it had been in the remote past. At this point, it became a lucid dream, in which he was aware he was dreaming. He began to walk faster, anxious to see as much as he could, before waking up. He noted that there were no birds in the sky, no animals visible on the plain, and that a broad river flowed northwest toward the sea. Now he emerged past the outcrops of rock, and looked along Windy Gap. The mountains on either side looked taller. 
about a mile away, on both sides of the river, he could see dark, grey, angular masses that looked like the buildings of a city. He stared at them, wondering if they were some kind of natural formation. But when he raised his field glasses to his eyes, there could be no doubt about it. These were buildings, massive buildings, with sloping sides and flat tops. To remove all possible doubt, many of them had tall openings like doors with curved tops, although as far as he could see, there was no sign of windows. What puzzled him was this did not look in the least like the city Plato had described in the Critias. That sounded more like ancient Athens. This looked like something out of a science fiction story. In spite of his efforts, the dream dissolved, and he found himself back in his room. As he lay there on the bed, he said aloud, Of course! For what he had forgotten was that Antarctica had not always been a land of icy winds. Exploration of some of the five percent of land that was free of ice had revealed coal deposits, which meant that it had once been covered with forests. Surely, the natural place to choose for a city would have been a river valley. They had been looking in the wrong direction. His first impulse was to hurry off and find Wilby. Yet the thought of describing his dream aroused in him an odd feeling of reluctance. He rationalized this by telling himself that, after all, Wilby was a scientist. What would he say to the suggestion that they should take soundings in Windy Gap simply because of a dream? Finally, my grandfather decided to keep it to himself. The next day, December 26, they returned to the base camp. There was no time for a Christmas holiday. They only had twelve weeks before the spring equinox, when Antarctica would return to darkness. As the helicopter descended toward the foot of Mount Holyoke, my grandfather pointed to Windy Gap, and shouted above the noise of the engine, "'Why don't we take some soundings there?' Wilby shrugged. "'Why not?' That night there was a storm, but when they woke up the next day— the sky was clear and bright, and the wind had dropped. By ten o'clock, they were taking their first sounding in Windy Gap. By midday, they had established that the river at this point had once been about two hundred yards wide, and about twice that depth. At five o'clock that afternoon, they were taking their eighth sounding, about a mile down the valley. This, my grandfather was convinced, was roughly where the city of his dream was situated. He describes in the journal how he found it hard to maintain his air of casualness, as Jim Peavy, the technician in charge of the sonar equipment, took another sounding. He watched intently as the pen traced a graph line on the paper tape. My grandfather said, "'Anything interesting?' Peavy, a phlegmatic southerner, did not even bother to reply. He merely shook his head. "'Let's try further on.' They loaded the equipment onto the dog sled and moved on. Wilby said, I think we'll make this the last of the day. My grandfather said nothing. He had no doubt that they were now above the city of his dream. Half an hour later, PV again activated the echo, then rotated the equipment to cover an area of a few hundred yards. As he studied the paper tape, his face remained impassive, my grandfather experienced a leaden sense of disappointment. Nothing? Nope. Then my grandfather was struck by a sudden thought. A river cuts down into the earth, deepening its valley. Suppose the city of his dream was very old, more than ten thousand years old. If the ice had returned to Antarctica five thousand years later, the river would have had a chance to cut far deeper than when the city was built. In that case, the remains of the city would now be above the floor of the valley, against the side of the mountain. Can you direct it over there? He pointed toward the slope of the mountain. Okay. My grandfather was aware that Wilby was looking at him curiously. He went across to Peavy, and watched as the tape came out of the side of the equipment. As he looked at the graph curve, his heart began to beat painfully. The pulse was being reflected back off large and irregular objects. 
Peavy said with sudden excitement. Yeah, there's something there, all right. Wilby studied the tape for a long time, then looked up at the mountain. It's debris from a landslide. Look. My grandfather could see what he meant. In the side of the mountain, a path about a quarter of a mile wide had been scooped in the grey rock. It was so smooth that no snow had settled on it. He pointed to the steep curves on the tape. These are big rocks. Do you mind if we take a closer look? They moved five hundred yards closer to the mountainside. Five minutes later, Peavy said, Yep, there's something there, all right. Wilby was studying the tape. Big rocks, some of them bigger than houses. Peavy looked doubtful. My grandfather said, What do you think, Jim? Peavy said, I'd say it's some kind of natural formation, like weathered volcanic lava. My grandfather knew what he had in mind. He had seen photographs of the forty-foot hexagonal columns of basalt in Fingal's cave. But I think it's too big to be basaltic lava. Wilby said, You could be right. We'll come back tomorrow. Why can't we do a few more soundings now? Because the wind's springing up again. Besides, we'll be late for dinner. They were back again early the next morning. Wilby admitted that he had been unable to sleep, wondering about the massive shapes. This time the sonar was set up close to the mountain face. During the next few hours, it was moved a dozen times to try to achieve greater definition. At a depth of more than half a mile, the outline of the rocks was blurred. While Peavy was pinning the paper tapes on a sheet of hardboard, Wilby said casually, "'Let's go and get some coffee.' They went to the sled and poured coffee from a flask. When Wilby was sure Peavy was out of earshot, he said, How did you know there was something there? Educated guesswork, Wilby said, and what else? My grandfather decided to tell the truth. All right, but you'll think I'm mad. I had a dream. A dream of what? A city, here in Windy Gap. What kind of a city? My grandfather did his best to describe it. When he had finished, Wilby said, Will you do me a favor? What? Don't mention this to anyone else. My dream? Of course I wouldn't. They might want to lock me up. Not just your dream. Don't mention the city. My grandfather was astonished. Why not? Wilby said patiently, Because it doesn't look like the remains of a city. It looks like the remains of a landslide. He pointed up at the mountain, and the evidence is there. My grandfather said, There's an easy way to find out. Move the sonar to the other side of the valley. The city was on both sides of the river. What do you bet that we find the same thing on the other side? Wilby said urgently, Keep your voice down. He glanced toward Peavy, who was looking across at them. My grandfather was baffled, and beginning to feel rather indignant. I simply don't understand. If I'm right, it could be the greatest discovery of the century. Wilby said patiently, You're not thinking this through, Dan. Think what will happen if we go back to Bird and say we found the remains of a city. It will be on the front page of the New York Times the next day, and in every newspaper in the world the day after that. And if you even breathe the word Atlantis, you'd be a laughingstock. For heaven's sake, I'm not that crazy. But you've got to look at the evidence. All right, there was a landslide, and it's covered some of the evidence. But look at those tapes. There's more than a landslide there. And all we have to do to prove it is move the sonar to the other side of the valley. That's just what we shouldn't do. For the moment, we've got to keep this to ourselves. Look out. Peavy came and joined them. He was carrying the hardboard under his arm. I don't understand this. If it's a landslide, it's not like any I've ever seen. Just look at the size of this. He pointed to a curve. That must be a fifty-foot block. He looked up at the mountain. And I just can't see where it came from. Wilby said, We'd have to climb Mount Holyoke to find out. PV was obviously intrigued by the problem. He walked away across the valley, taking the binoculars so he could get a view of the higher reaches of the mountain. 
when they were alone, my grandfather said, I agree with you about scientific caution, but this is suppressing information. Wilby said, Have you ever heard of Don Marcelino de Sortola? No. He was a Spanish nobleman who found an underground cave on his property. When he looked inside it, he found pictures of bulls on the walls, bulls drawn by Cro-Magnon men. But the pigment was still wet, and when he announced his discovery, the experts denounced him as a fraud. He fought for years to clear his name. He pointed out that he had no reason to forge the paintings, but no one believed him. Then they began to discover more paintings, in caves in the Vizier Valley, with the pigment still wet, and they realized that Don Marcelino had been telling the truth all along. But it was too late to apologize. He was already dead. The experts had made the rest of his life a misery with their accusations. So Don Marcelino never lived to see Altamira become one of the most famous caves in the world. Now tell me, if he'd been able to foresee what would happen, do you think he would have announced his discovery? My grandfather had to admit that this was unanswerable. He knew enough about the academic world to know that a professor who becomes an object of ridicule is a liability to his university. He said, But suppose we had evidence, evidence of massive structures that couldn't be natural features. If we had real evidence, we'd be obliged to announce it. But we don't have evidence yet. Then let's look on the other side of the valley. All right, but not now. Let's wait for an opportunity when there's just the two of us. That evening, when they were alone, they renewed the conversation. This is what my grandfather said in his journal. I have to admire Wilby's cool head. Without him, I would have told Peavy that I think it's the remains of a city, and Peavy would have told the rest of the team. In fact, they're away mapping Erebus at the moment, and someone would have passed it back to Bird, and it would be unstoppable. But Wilby is obviously right. With something as big as this, it's best not to go off at half-cock. Now we have to wait for an opportunity to try the north side of the valley. Four days later, after a New Year's Eve celebration, Peavy stayed behind with an upset stomach, and the conspirators had their opportunity. It was an icy cold day, with the temperature below zero, and a strong wind blowing down the valley. But this did not deter them. By ten in the morning, they were back at the site of their previous soundings, then turned across the valley at ninety degrees. They were so anxious to get it right, that they preferred to do this rather than travel down the far side of the valley and risk missing the spot by a hundred yards. My grandfather told me, that as they unloaded and set up the sonar, he felt like a burglar, afraid that they'd be interrupted. For this first probe, they set up within a few hundred yards of the side of the valley, which was less steep than on the south side. As the paper tape came out of its slot, Wilby glanced at it and said, It looks as if he could be right. My grandfather's hands were shaking as he reached out for the tape. The shape of the graph curve left no doubt that there was something down there under the ice, something big. My grandfather pointed up the mountain. You see, no sign of a landslide here. Wilby studied the tape. True, but this doesn't look like buildings either. It's not regular enough. For God's sake, George, neither are the ruins of ancient Rome. Over the next two hours, they moved the sonar a dozen times. The results were exciting, and at the same time frustrating. The ruins extended along a slope several hundred yards above the valley floor. To my grandfather, what had happened was obvious. The city he had seen had been undermined by erosion, so that most of it had collapsed into the deepening valley carved by the river. What remained clung to the hillsides on either side of the valley. But the ice in the valley was, in effect, a gigantic slow-moving river, and the remains of the city were ground like rocks into the bed of a torrent. The clear, rectangular shapes that my grandfather had glimpsed in his dream had been eroded into irregular masses that could be mistaken for gigantic boulders. It was true that 
Many of these boulders looked oddly like the work of men, but to the eye of the skeptic they were merely impressive natural features. By one o'clock, when they broke off for a lunch of sandwiches and coffee, huddled under blankets in the sled, my grandfather knew that Wilby had been right. With evidence as ambiguous as this, it would have been a disaster even to hint at man-made structures. Which is why, when reports of their findings appeared in the publications of the International Geophysical Year, the ruins were described as puzzling and undetermined natural features under the ice, which spread along both sides of the valley for a distance of perhaps a quarter of a mile. When my grandfather returned home in the third week of March, he could hardly wait to tell Hapgood what he had found. Yet their meeting also turned out to be something of a disappointment. Hapgood was deeply interested, of course, but my grandfather's hints over the telephone had led him to expect something more definite than huge blocks that might be natural features. He later told my father that he had been hoping for evidence of a port, or some similar discovery, where the ice shelf joined the land. When my grandfather asked him what he had meant about Atlantis, Hap could explain that he had merely intended to point out that, if Plato was right, a pre-Ice Age civilization could have created buildings as massive as the temples of Egypt. But then, he added, Atlantis was probably a myth created by Plato. My grandfather felt that Hapgood was being less than candid. After all, why bother to mention Atlantis at all if he felt it to be a myth? So the afternoon he spent with Hapgood, although friendly enough, lacked the warmth and excitement of their previous meetings. Between March 1958 and the publication of Hapgood's Maps of the Ancient Seekings, Evidence of Advanced Civilization in the Ice Age in 1966, they met on only three occasions. The third of these was the book's launching party in Philadelphia. It was brought out by a Philadelphia publisher, when my grandfather and grandmother drank to his fame and success. Of course, nothing of the sort happened. The reviews were mostly favourable, and Hapgood made a number of appearances on radio and television. Naturally, the academics ignored it completely. Within six months, the book had been more or less forgotten. How could this happen to a work as important as Maps of the Ancient Seekings? The answer, unfortunately, is that Hapgood had been anticipated. In 1960, a book called Le Maton de Magicians, The Morning of the Magicians, had been published in Paris. The authors were a journalist called Louis Powells, and a student of alchemy named Jacques Berger. It is a strange mishmash of occultism, prophecy, flying saucers, the Great Pyramid, and Hitler's astrologers, and it became an immediate bestseller. Translated into a dozen languages, it launched the occult revival of the late twentieth century. In the midst of a discussion of lost civilizations, it explains that, in the middle of the nineteenth century, a Turkish naval officer, Piri Reis, presented the Library of Congress with a set of maps he had discovered in the East. All this, of course, is absurdly inaccurate. The authors ask, had these maps been traced from observations made on board a flying machine or spaceship of some kind, notes taken by visitors from beyond. So the medieval Portolans achieved worldwide notoriety as proof that Earth had been visited in the remote past by visitors from outer space. The Morning of the Magicians appeared in America in 1963, and became a bestseller there, too. So the critics can hardly be blamed for failing to distinguish between Hapgood's sober and serious study of ancient maps and this lurid occult journalism. Worse was to come. In 1967, a Swiss writer named Eric von Daniken produced a book called Chariots of the Gods, which was advertised under the rubric, Did God Drive a Flying Saucer? It sold a million copies— and since it contained even more absurdities and inaccuracies than the morning of the magicians, aroused the same fury in serious reviewers. The latest studies of Professor Charles H. Hapgood, declares von Daniken, 
gives us some more shattering information. Comparison with the modern photographs of our globe taken from satellites showed that the originals of Peary Race's maps must have been aerial photographs taken from a very great height. How can that be explained? It can be explained, of course, by recognizing that von Daniken is talking nonsense. Hapgood never mentioned aerial photographs taken from a very great height. But everyone who read Chariots of the Gods assumed that Hap could believe that Antarctica had been photographed from a flying saucer in the days before it was covered with ice. There was no way he could escape being tarred with the same brush as von Daniken and the authors of The Morning of the Magicians. Hapgood succeeded in getting his book republished in 1979, not long before his death, but by then the damage had been done. A book that should have been as epoch-making as Darwin's Origin of Species continued to be ignored. Two. And how did I come to be involved in this bizarre and complicated story? It started when I was thirteen, and was spending the weekend in Rye Beach, a small sea town in New Hampshire, where my grandfather had retired when he left the university. My father, Richard Willoughby, had inherited none of my grandfather's interest in science and mathematics. In fact, he hated them both. As a teenager, he came upon a book by Young, and decided he wanted to be a psychiatrist. He studied medicine at Johns Hopkins, became a consultant psychiatrist in the mid-1980s, and achieved celebrity with his book Shadows in the Mind in 1989. We lived in Riverside Drive, New York, and I went to school in Morris Heights. My grandfather said very little about his son's chosen profession, but I had a feeling that he regarded psychology as a pseudoscience. I took after my grandfather— and from the time he gave me a kind of cartoon picture book called Frontiers of Science when I was ten, dreamed of becoming a scientist. Our family often went to visit with my grandfather on weekends, but when I was thirteen, I spent most of the summer holidays at Rye Beach. My grandfather was at that time seventy-three, a tall man with a nose like an eagle and a pointed chin. We used to take long walks— and he first introduced me to the ideas of Einstein, Planck, and Gödel. Both his sons had been something of a disappointment to him, for neither showed any aptitude for mathematics. My uncle Karl became an actor, so he was delighted to find that I wanted to follow in his footsteps. I was given a free run of his library, and it was there that I discovered his signed copy of Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. It seemed an unusual kind of book to find on his shelf, among books on bridge-building and chaos theory, and I took it off to the beach. As soon as I read the opening sentence, this book is the story of the discovery of the first evidence that advanced peoples preceded all the peoples now known to history. I was hooked. All this talk about the sea kings of ancient Crete and the great library of Alexandria made my hair tingle with excitement. I found it so exciting that before the afternoon was over, I had turned to the last chapter, A Civilization That Vanished, and read it while I was only halfway through the book. As soon as I got back, I asked my grandfather about it, and why Hapgood had dedicated the book to my old friend and supporter. My grandfather was drinking the martini he always poured himself at half-past five, and was feeling relaxed and expansive. He told me to sit down in the other armchair, poured me a glass of sweet sherry, and then told me the whole story, from the time he went on the radio with Mallory to the fiasco of the publication of Hapgood's book. By the time we went out to dinner at the seafood restaurant across the road, I was as excited as my grandfather had been when he overheard his father talking about the great hole in the South Pole. It seemed to me incredible that Hapgood had proved that an Ancient civilization existed in Antarctica thousands of years before ancient Egypt, and that his findings had been ignored. I was also excited by his hint about Atlantis. My grandfather told me that when he pressed Hapgood to tell him whether he thought these inhabitants of the South Pole came from Atlantis, Hapgood privately admitted that he thought it highly probable. 
I wanted to know why Hapgood had not said so in his book, and my grandfather explained that this would have been disastrous for his academic reputation. I still found it impossible to understand why my grandfather had not continued to pursue this fascinating question. After all, if an ancient civilization did exist under the ice of the Antarctic, it would change our whole vision of human history, and the man who first proved it was true would achieve everlasting fame. My grandfather smiled ironically, and said he had once thought the same thing. At this point, my grandmother intervened. She was a quiet woman who seldom spoke, but now she said that she had often wished that he had pursued the question of the lost civilization. He had often talked of writing a book about it. Why not start now? He shook his head. Wilby was right. There's just not enough evidence. I fed those paper tapes into a computer, and they show immense blocks. What if there was a city down there? It's been pulverized by the glacier. I didn't understand this. But you told me that there were huge blocks of stone on either side of Windy Gap, and if there was some easy way of getting down to them, I'd be trying to form an expedition myself, but there's no conceivable way of cutting down through three thousand feet of ice. How about an oil drill? That would do it, of course. But what would we do then? Send someone down in a bucket with a candle? But there must be some way. Isn't there any drill that could make a wide tunnel? The kind of drills they use to make railway tunnels under mountains? I've thought of that, too. It would cost millions of dollars to transport such a drill to the Antarctic. And what would happen when you got down there? You'd find yourself looking at a rock as big as a house. What do you do then? Take a pick and shovel? My grandmother said, But perhaps it wouldn't be a rock. Perhaps it would be a house. True. That would settle it once and for all. But it wouldn't be worth spending a million dollars unless you were fairly certain it was going to be a house. You see, the truth is that what we really need is for all the ice in that valley to melt away so we could see exactly what's underneath it. Then I'm sure we'd find all the evidence we need about a city, if it exists. I asked, do you think it exists? I honestly can't say. I believe there's evidence of an ancient civilization somewhere under that ice, but whether it's in Windy Gap, I don't know. I just had a dream, that's all. My grandmother said, and your dreams often come true. You remember about Mary Dexter's wedding? My grandfather began to laugh. You're the kind of wife who ruins her husband's reputation. At that point the food arrived, and the subject was abandoned. But the conversation, aided possibly by the lobster claws, had inflamed my imagination to such an extent that I spent half the night dreaming about Atlantis and vast underground cities. Back at home I told the whole story to my father— and was gratified when he seemed fascinated. Intellectually speaking, he and my grandfather had never been close, since my father's interests had always been literary, rather than scientific. But this strange tale of a lost civilization touched his imagination, and he borrowed maps of the ancient sea kings from the New York Public Library. He was as impressed as I was, and next time my grandfather came to visit— I listened in while they had a discussion about how the ice could be penetrated. Like me, he suggested tunneling equipment. My grandfather pointed out that when a tunnel is driven through a mountain, they build a railway track to remove the earth in trucks. Such a track would have to be built in Windy Gap to remove millions of tons of ice. The cost would be prohibitive. I asked, what about some machine that breathed fire, like that thing you have for burning weeds in the garden? My grandfather laughed. It would fill the shaft with water, but you could pump it out. Yes, I suppose you could. I had an idea. Couldn't you make some kind of machine like a rocket with a red-hot point that would cut down through the ice? Then you could travel down through the ice as if you were in a diving bell. My grandfather nodded. Yes, that might work. During the next weeks, I devoted a great deal of intellectual energy to the problem of how to penetrate half a mile of ice. It seemed amazing 
that such a simple-looking problem could be so baffling. It goes without saying that I told everybody who would listen. All my friends, the science master, the bosomy lady who taught us literature, two uncles, and on one occasion a total stranger who was sitting next to me on the subway and reading an article about Antarctica in the Scientific American. All of them were interested, but they all admitted that they had no idea of how to solve the problem of how to tunnel down through half a mile of ice. As far as I could see, the simplest and most obvious solution was to use an oil drill, which would have no difficulty in sinking a well into the ice. I suggested this to Dr. Wilby the first time I met him at my grandfather's house, and he pointed out that the cost of transporting a drilling rig four hundred miles inland from the Ross Sea, where Shell was then making some test drills, would be enormous. I refused to give up. During the next year or so, I suggested at least six more ideas that had real possibilities. The most practical of these, I believe, was using superheated steam to vaporize the ice, which would rise into the air and descend elsewhere as rain. My grandfather objected that this would merely convert most of the ice into water, and leave us with a vast lake that would freeze up again the same night. I didn't agree— but had no way of proving my point without putting it to the practical test. The solution came through a series of chance events. The first was my meeting with Gordon Trask. At that time, no one had heard of Trask, in spite of the fact that he had almost as many patents to his name as Edison or Tesla. He had never aroused the interest of the popular press. So when, in my second year at Columbia, I heard that he was lecturing to the science club on the future of science. I had to ask my roommate who he was. Oh, I don't know, some kind of inventor. Even that failed to arouse my interest. I planned to take a girl named Coral to a meeting of the European Film Society. I had known her a week, and was convinced I was in love. So when, at the last moment, she told me that she had to go out to dinner with a visiting relative— I suspected infidelity, and thought of going out to get drunk. Then I realized that I only had five dollars in my wallet, and decided to go home instead. Yet, just as I was about to walk to the bus stop, I felt an odd compulsion to go back on campus. I went to the notice board to see what was happening that evening, decided against the meeting of the Charles Ive Society, and somehow found myself in Trask's lecture. There were not more than twenty people in the room, and Trask had already started when I arrived. He was talking about the psychology of invention, and some of his examples were, to put it mildly, rather abstruse, so that half the audience looked baffled. Trask was not a good speaker. A small, thin man with a high, domed forehead, piercing blue eyes, a big, curved nose, and a slightly nasal voice— he had an odd habit of ceasing to speak, and staring intently at the table, as if he had seen some amazing and rare beetle. Then he opened and closed the fingers of his right hand in an abrupt, jerky way, and launched into some explanation about computers that seemed to have no relation to what he had been saying earlier. Occasionally, his face would break into a sudden bright smile, as if he had just said something astounding— but what followed was as incomprehensible as the rest. His intellectual enthusiasm would have been infectious if we had been able to understand what he was talking about. He made me think of a kind of disconnected Sherlock Holmes. In a sense, what he was saying was quite simple, that there is a fundamental difference between computers and the human brain, and he was criticizing computer experts who one day hoped to create a living computer. The problem was that he assumed we knew as much as he did, so that most of what he said was above our heads. At the end of his talk, Bob Scarsby, the chairman, made a short speech about the fascinating lecture, and most of the audience stampeded for the bar. I was about to do the same thing when, for the second time that evening, I found myself doing something I had not intended. I went forward to the lectern to speak to him. Our visiting celebrities usually ended up with a crowd around them, but on this occasion I was the only one. Which is how, half an hour later, 
I found myself sitting in a cheap Italian restaurant with Bob Scarsby and Gordon Trask, eating pasta at the expense of the science club. When Bob invited me to join them, I had been a little worried at the prospect of dining with someone whose mind seemed to operate on such an incredible level of abstraction. But once I noticed the way that he spilled tomato sauce on his bow tie and started to put salt in his coffee before Bob stopped him, I began to feel more at ease. He was obviously a genuine example of the absent-minded genius. While we were waiting for the food, Bob made the mistake of asking him about pesticides, which led to a baffling discourse on molecular biology. I decided to try to get some sense out of him by asking my favorite question. If you were an archaeologist, and you had to penetrate half a mile of ice, how would you do it? He thought for a moment, then said, with a giant mechanical digger, the kind they use in open cast mines. And suppose it was in the middle of the Antarctic, so the cost would be prohibitive. I'd begin to think in terms of laser technology. I experienced a bubble of rising excitement. Could you explain, sir? I saw Bob wince, preparing for another barrage of impenetrable computeries. Instead, Trask smiled and said, And what would be the purpose of this exercise? Have you heard of Charles Hapgood? No. Who is he? I launched into my well-prepared presentation of the theory of pre-Ice Age civilization. Within a few minutes, I could see I had them both hooked. Whenever I felt ashamed of monopolizing the conversation, they both begged me to go on. I told them about my grandfather's visit to Antarctica during the IGY, and about the great stone blocks buried under the glacier. Trask interrupted me. Has he had the data analyzed by computer? I think so. With what result? I couldn't tell you. But it wasn't as exciting as he expected. Don't forget their sonar was an early model. 1957. Then what makes him so certain that it wasn't merely a landslide? The fact that it was on both sides of the valley, just as he expected. Bob said, Haven't they been back since? No, my grandfather seemed to lose heart. Nobody seemed interested and I explained how Hapgood had suffered from ancient astronaut theorists like von Daniken. Trask said, If you'd like to ask him to send his data to my laboratory, we'll do a computer analysis. I did my best not to show just how delighted I felt by asking, Could a laser cut through half a mile of ice? Oh, certainly. But that isn't the problem. A laser can cut through anything by focusing its energy down to a point. But of course— that would cut a hole the width of a needle, which wouldn't be of much use. The real problem is that even the most powerful lasers are about 95% inefficient. Chemical lasers are about 12% efficient. Even my new zirconium laser is only 15%. The best solution would be a free electron laser. They can be tuned to microwave frequencies. I knew enough about microwaves to know that they produce heat. You mean you could create a kind of heat ray, like Wells Martians? In theory, yes. And once again, he launched into explanations that went way above our heads. But this time I was determined to understand, so I interrupted him with questions. It soon dawned on me that he wasn't really an absent-minded professor, incapable of explaining himself in simple words— the trouble was that he knew so much that he couldn't really grasp that other people knew so little. Once he knew what you didn't know, he could explain something with amazing simplicity. I knew a little about lasers, but Bob, whose subject was sociology, knew nothing at all. So Trask began from the beginning. I was so fascinated that I can repeat it virtually word for word. When a poker is heated, he explained, its atoms and molecules become more and more excited, like a lot of people jumping up and down, until the poker gets red-hot and gives off light. But the light it gives off is of many different wavelengths, and therefore colors. When a poker is white-hot, it is giving off all the colors of the spectrum. At this point, the people are running about all over the place. There is a way of influencing the excited molecule or atom so it gives off energy by firing energy of a certain wavelength at it. For example, 
If you fire a microwave pulse at an ammonia molecule, the molecule gives off another microwave pulse. Then those two microwave pulses hit two more molecules, and they give off two more pulses. In a short time, you've got an avalanche of pulses, as in a microwave oven. The principle is called a maser. You can do the same thing with light. If you fire a pulse of light at a certain kind of atom, it gives off light of the same wavelength. If this light hits another excited atom, that one does the same. So now, instead of a crowd running madly all over the place, you have them marching in step like an army. A laser is made of light beams of the same color, all marching in step. So, when they're focused and aimed at a piece of metal or ice, they punch a hole straight through it. The problem, as Trask said, is that the process is so inefficient. It takes a vast amount of energy to make a laser work, and ninety-five percent of this is wasted. In principle, a laser or maser should give off an explosion of energy comparable to an atom bomb. The free electron laser that Trask mentioned is more efficient. This takes a beam of electrons produced by a particle accelerator and bends it into a spiral by an array of electromagnets. This is the type of laser that President Reagan had in mind to knock out IBMs in his Star Wars proposal, which explains why Trask thought that laser beams might be the answer to the problem of Windy Gap. Most scientists would consider such an approach a waste of time, like using a surgical scalpel to cut down a tree. But Trask was convinced that the free electron laser could be made to generate the same kind of power as a chainsaw. His laboratory had been working on the idea for the past year. I asked, and how far have you got? Quite a way, but I have to admit there's still a long way to go. I was so excited by all this that as soon as I got home, I telephoned my grandfather. He was in bed at the time, but not yet asleep. When I mentioned Trask, he was impressed. There was an article about him in Science Monthly. They compared him to Edison. He wants you to send him your sonar data, and he'll try computer enhancement. We've already tried that, but that was years ago. His equipment is state-of-the-art. All right. It can't do any harm to see what happens. As I climbed into bed that night, I was fairly certain that I was not going to sleep. It made me wish I'd had more to drink in the restaurant. Since Trask was a teetotaler, Bob and I had confined ourselves to a single glass of the house wine. I could not have been more mistaken. As soon as my head touched the pillow, I fell into a deep and peaceful sleep. When I woke up in the early hours of the morning, I had a curious sense of contentment and well-being. Then, toward dawn, I had a marvellous dream of Antarctica. I was in Windy Gap with a crew of scientists and technicians, and we were about to start blasting a hole in the ice with a laser that looked like a giant telescope. It was all so clear and real that I believed I was actually there. I was wearing fur-lined boots, and when I stamped my feet, I could feel the snow crunching underfoot. At this point, one of the team got down on all fours and peered through the ice. He seemed so excited that I did the same brushing aside the snow with my gloved hand. I was astonished to find that the ice was as clear as glass, and that I could see down through it. Far below, at a depth of about a hundred feet, I could see people walking around. Then one of them looked up and pointed. They all stared up toward us, and one of them waved. I felt myself waking up and struggled against it. I wanted to see what happened next. Finally— I gave up the struggle and opened my eyes. The sky was turning light, and I felt that I had been through a strange and wonderful experience. I lay there for perhaps five minutes, feeling oddly contented, as if it were Christmas morning and I was a child again. From then on, I had an odd feeling of certainty that I was destined to play a central role in solving this problem of Hapgood's pre-Ice Age civilization. Whenever I thought about Antarctica, I experienced a sense of warmth around the heart, 
as if I'd entered into some kind of agreement with fate. From that point, everything seemed to go right. Up to that point, I'd been like any normal teenager, expecting things to go wrong, missing buses, saying the wrong thing, tripping as I left the room. Now, I would flip open a telephone directory and find that I was looking at the right page. I would arrive in a full parking lot just as someone was vacating a space. I would stumble upon some important piece of information just before it was raised in class, giving me a spurious air of being well informed. Just as a test, I began trying to guess what bus would be along next, and found that I had an amazingly high score. Even my love life suddenly improved. I had become accustomed to a fairly high level of frustration and failure, often due to clumsiness or tactlessness. Now I seemed incapable of saying or doing the wrong thing. It turned out, for example, that I had been correct in suspecting that Coral had been lying when she said she had to go out with visiting relatives. She was actually going to the theatre with a football player named Josh Rubin. But two days later they quarrelled, and when she bumped into me in Washington Square, she invited me to dinner in the apartment she shared with two other girls. I spent the evening telling them about Hapgood and my grandfather, and had the satisfaction of seeing them hang on every word I spoke. As she walked me to the subway, Coral was already hinting about getting engaged. That following weekend, my grandparents came to stay, and Trask was invited to dinner. He arrived an hour late, looking untidier than ever, and with the tomato sauce stain still on his bow tie. At first, he seemed shy and absent minded. I discovered later that he hated social engagements. But when my grandfather produced copies of the sonar tapes from his briefcase, his abstraction disappeared. He seemed to be able to read them as a musician can read music. He asked, Can I use your fax machine? I'd like to send these to my laboratory. My mother asked, Will there be anybody there at this time? Of course. My chief assistant, Bill Ruggles, usually stays till midnight. Within two hours, while we were still sitting at the dinner table, there was a ring at the doorbell. It was Bill Ruggles, a chunkily built man only a few years older than myself, with the computer enhancements. As soon as I looked at the first one, my heart began to pound. It looked, quite simply, like a giant building block, and I knew from the earlier computer enhancement that it had to be at least as big as the room we were sitting in. There were about two dozen of these enhancements, and, unlike the earlier set, which were merely line drawings, the computer had turned these into something like black-and-white photographs. Those from the south side of the valley were particularly clear. There could be no reasonable doubt— that what we were looking at were the remains of collapsed buildings, buildings that, at a guess, had originally been a hundred feet tall. We all felt stunned. My mother was the only one to behave normally. She offered Bill Ruggles some food, which he accepted enthusiastically, and went off to carve the remains of the roast beef. Trask handed my grandfather the sonar reproductions. Well, it seems we have to congratulate you. My grandfather shook his head as if he was dazed. I find it hard to take in, after forty years. My father said, It looks as if you were right about Atlantis. Trask echoed, Atlantis? My grandfather looked as if somebody had stepped on his corn. Oh, for heaven's sake, Dick! My father said, Why not tell them? Somebody's going to have to. My grandfather said desperately, because it's just a crazy idea. Trask said, I enjoy crazy ideas. Please go ahead. In the end, I had to explain. My grandfather's academic caution reduced him to incoherence. I described how Hapgood had been the first to mention Atlantis, and how he'd refused to elaborate. But the evidence of the blocks made it look as if he'd been right, after all. If Antarctica had been inhabited— the people had to come from somewhere, and Plato's Atlantis seemed as good a guess as any. After all, where else was there around 7,000 B.C.? Bill Ruggles, who had by now cleared his plate, 
interrupted to say that he'd seen a television program that argued that ancient Egypt was peopled by survivors from Atlantis, and that the Egyptians also built their early temples with gigantic building blocks, some of them weighing two hundred tons. When Trask said he'd also heard something about the theory, my grandfather looked relieved to realize they didn't think he was mad, after all. The following day, I paid my first visit to Trask's laboratory, a few blocks from Columbia, near Marcus Garvey Park. Although it was a Sunday, the place was as active as a beehive— Bill Ruggles, who showed me around, explained that nobody had to work Sundays, but that most of them couldn't be kept away. The place was enormous, a whole floor of the building, and the number of projects staggering. Bill Ruggles, working on the free electron laser, had a whole room to himself, but in the main lab there were at least a dozen major projects, including permanent paper that would never deteriorate, the instant freezer— which could reduce a glass of water to ice in thirty seconds, a portable voice computer for translating instantaneously from one language to another, a glue that would seal broken glass without a sign of a crack, a hearing aid so tiny it could be implanted below the skin of the inner ear, and a long-life atomic battery that would last for twenty-five years. Trask had already patented his own two-year atomic battery. In the drug's research unit, they were investigating the properties of the butterfly flower from central New Guinea, which has now been developed into the most powerful schizophrenia drug so far, while in the general medical unit, the limbless genius Brian Swarkin, who had lost both arms and legs as a result of an auto crash, was synthesizing Zwarkonin, which, as everyone knows, will knit broken bones in less than an hour. I suspect that most of the people I met assumed that Trask had selected me as a future recruit, and they treated me as a colleague. A week earlier, I would have found it overwhelming to be given free access to the secrets of Trask's creation factory, as one journalist labelled it. Now I took it in my stride. After all, I had been responsible for bringing Trask and my grandfather together— and if Hapgood's lost civilization was discovered beneath the Antarctic ice, I felt I would deserve a great deal of the credit. What happened next confirmed my feeling that I was somehow on a winning streak. Bill Ruggles knocked on a glass-plated door at the end of the corridor. When someone called, Come in, he opened it, then said, I'm sorry, Anton, I thought you were alone. That's okay, I'd finished. Come on in. I was introduced to Anton Voronsky, a psychologist from the Manhattan Psychiatric Clinic, who in turn introduced us to a young, dark-haired girl who looked about fifteen, and whose name was Inga. I didn't catch her surname. She said, "'How do you do?' with a charming foreign accent. Voronsky, a slight, grey-haired man with rimless glasses, explained that he had just been testing her for extrasensory perception— and that her score had been just below a hundred percent. He was obviously delighted, and insisted on demonstrating her prowess. He made her turn her back, then asked us to give him something out of our pockets. Ruggles produced a ball bearing, and I produced an eraser. Voronsky went to a series of inverted plastic cups on the table, and placed the ball bearing and the eraser below two of them, chosen at random. Inga was standing in a corner— with a hat stand in front of her. Voronsky said, All right, Inga. She crossed to the table, stared intently at the row of cups, twelve of them, then unhesitatingly reached out and pointed to the two that Voronsky had chosen. He said, Any idea what they are? She said, This is a ball bearing. The other, she hesitated and frowned. It is some kind of cube— but it is made of rubber. Voronsky lifted the cups with an air of triumph. She's been doing that all morning, and when I threw a die she got twelve out of twelve. In the second test I threw the die while taking care not to see the result, in case she was reading my mind, and she still got twelve out of twelve. Even I knew that was impressive. I looked with awe at this slender girl, 
who looked as if she weighed less than a hundred pounds, and wondered what my father would say when I told him I had met a witch. She even looked a little like a witch. Her face would have been pretty, if her lips had not been so pale and her eyes so large. Bill and I had finished our tour, and he had to get back to work. I had seen the free electron laser in operation, and watched it drill a two-inch hole in a sheet of copper. He explained that this was an important advance, since most lasers had to be focused down to a point. It struck me that it would take a lot of two-inch holes to make a sizable tunnel down through the ice. His last words to me at the door were, In six months, I'm hoping to make a six-inch hole. On the pavement at 125th Street, I saw Inga waiting for the light to change. I said hello and asked her which way she was walking. When she said she was headed to 138th Street, I offered to walk with her, since it was on my way home. It was a beautiful day, just cool enough to make it comfortable walking. We walked two blocks to Roosevelt Square, then north up Convent. When I asked her if she was at school, she amazed me by telling me she was twenty-two, and that she worked with her brothers and sisters in a group called the Vasilevskys. In Russia, there had been a circus act, and she had trained as a tightrope walker and a bareback rider. Her elder brother, Pavel, was the greatest juggler in the world, but they all had psychic powers. An impresario called Boris Belmont had brought them to America, but he was a crook, and now they were on their own. She asked me about myself, and when I mentioned that my father was a psychiatrist named Richard Willoughby, looked interested. Is he not a friend of Professor Hallam? Naming one of my father's colleagues. It seemed that Hallam had suggested that my father ought to meet the Vasilevskys. Why don't you come home and meet him now? We'll just be in time for lunch. She thought about it for a moment, then gave a wonderful bright smile that made my heart turn a somersault. All right. In fact, my father had already asked Hallam to arrange an introduction, and was delighted to meet her. It seemed that she, and her two brothers and younger sister, were the rising stars of paranormal research. On Hallam's advice, they had turned down an offer to appear on a popular television program. He wanted them to go through rigorous scientific tests before they exposed themselves to the media circus. As a Jungian, my father was sympathetic to the claims of paranormal research, although he had never been involved in testing psychics, and Hallam felt he would be the ideal person to form a preliminary assessment. At lunch, Inga confined herself to vegetables and bottled water. As soon as she overcame her shyness, she talked freely about her life in Russia, her early years in Smolensk, her training as an acrobat, and her years in a circus. I described how she had located the ball bearing and the eraser under the cups, and my father asked, Can you do it now? My mother started to protest, but Inga said promptly and without hesitation, Of course. She went and leaned out of the open window, and my father inverted six coffee cups on the table. My grandfather took from his coat pocket a tiny portable toothbrush of the kind they issue on airplanes. I knew what it was because I had one myself, but to anyone who had never seen one, it looked like a green plastic tube. My grandfather placed this under one of the cups. Then Inga was told she could turn around. She glanced at the cups, and without hesitation placed her finger on the right one. My father asked, Can you tell what it is? A little brush. She had not only seen through the cup, but through the plastic tube that held the brush. We were all astonished. After that, no one had any doubt of her paranormal powers. Pleased with our admiration, she said, Would you like me to do something else? We nodded enthusiastically. She said, I will try to make that cloud go away. She pointed out of the open window. It was a clear, still day with hardly any breeze, and a small white cloud was hanging over the river in the blue sky. She said, I am not quite sure I can do it. Usually my brothers and sisters help me, but I will try. We all stood up to watch her. 
She crossed to the window and stared at the cloud. For perhaps half a minute nothing happened. Then the cloud seemed to drift apart. In less than a minute it was gone. We all applauded. There was simply no possibility of trickery. Inga came and sat down. I noticed that there was a film of sweat on her forehead, and she was breathing deeply, as if the effort had wearied her. I said, Was it tiring? She wrinkled her nose and shook her head. Not very, but I was nervous. I saw my father glance out of the corner of his eye at my grandfather. One of their main points of disagreement, dating back many years, was Young's interest in the paranormal. My grandfather thought Young was an old fraud, and that ghosts, poltergeists, extrasensory perception, and the rest was simply a silly superstition. Yet he had just seen Inga perform two supernatural feats that were self-evidently genuine. A skeptic might cavil, Are you sure she wasn't peering while you put the toothbrush under the cup? Are you sure the cloud wouldn't have dissolved anyway? But no one who was in that room could doubt for a moment that there was no trickery. When we had finished eating, she performed several more impressive feats. She asked me to take a book off the shelf, open it, and read a page. The book was one of a set of Lafcadio Hearn, and I opened it at random, as she told me to, and read a page. She was sitting opposite me in an armchair. Before I had finished the page, she said, I see three men, Chinamen, sitting on cane chairs and drinking tea. Now they are looking at something, looking at bowls, and another man has come in to join them. I read the page aloud, describing a visit to a Zen temple, in which Hearn sits drinking green tea with two priests. One of them offers to show him some rare bowls, and as they go in to see them, they are joined by another priest. Inga was exactly right, except for mistaking the Japanese priests for Chinamen. She went on to read everyone's mind in turn. My grandmother simply tried envisaging a scene from her childhood, with her sister in a red swing under a lilac tree, and Inga described everything, including the lilac tree. Finally, she demonstrated her ability to snap metal— my mother sealed a darning needle in a tube used for effervescent vitamin C tablets. Inga took the tube, held it in her hands for a moment, then handed it back. When my mother unsealed the cap, the needle was snapped into two pieces. My grandmother said nervously, "'Can you read our minds all the time?' "'Oh, no. You have to create an image in your mind and hold it like a picture. Then I can tune into your picture.' It was after four o'clock, and Inga said she had to get back. I was suddenly stricken with guilt. Of course! Your family doesn't know where you are. She said, Oh no, I told my brother Rodion. You rang him? No, I sent him a message. My father was fascinated. How? I can't explain how. My mind spoke to his. My father, being a scientist, wanted to check. Inga gave him the number of her hotel. My father rang and asked if he could speak to Rodion Vasilevsky. A moment later, I heard him ask, Do you know where your sister is? Then he smiled at us and said, He said she is standing right at the side of me. Which was true. I walked her back to the hotel, only four blocks away, and she invited me up to meet her family. It was a fairly inexpensive hotel— and all four were sharing a single large room with two double beds. Apparently, they were quite used to this kind of overcrowding. Pavel was big, powerfully built, with a very Russian face and short cropped hair. Rodion, who was eighteen, was slim with dark hair and dark eyes, and a quiet manner. Natalia, the youngest, had short cropped blonde hair, blue eyes, and a kind of bubbling vitality and charm that instantly made her the centre of attention. If she had been ten years older, I would have fallen in love with her. They gave me tea and a cookie the size of a saucer with a cherry on top, then listened while Inga described the afternoon. Rodion verified that 
They had not been anxious about Inga, because they had been in touch while Inga was eating lunch. After this, the boys announced that they were hungry, and wanted to go out for a cheeseburger. They loved American food, particularly junk food. I walked downstairs with them, and across St. Nicholas Park. In the park, Pavel surprised me by asking if I wanted to see some of their act. Wondering what I was letting myself in for, I said yes. At this, Rodion bent down, and Natalia ran at him, sailed over his back, and was caught by Pavel, who tossed her into the air and made her turn a double somersault. She landed on her hands in Inga's hands, and the two stood upright, with Natalia upside down in the air. Then they did the most amazing thing I have ever seen. Inga leapt as Natalia fell. Natalia sprang upright, and somehow they were reversed, with Natalia holding Inga above her in the air as straight and still as a ramrod. They seemed to defy the force of gravity. For the next five minutes I stood and gaped at the amazing flying bodies, hardly able to believe that human beings could be so graceful. At one point, Pavel acted as a kind of ringmaster, standing with his feet apart and one arm outstretched, while Natalia, bent into a circle, whirled around his hand like a hula hoop. By this time a crowd had gathered, and we moved on, to the obvious disappointment of the students from City College. They were in high spirits, and we walked down 135th Street toward the river. Inga pointed to a cloud and said, Now we show you. All four stood and focused on it, and in a matter of seconds it was gone. I said, But how do you do it? Pavel said, Easy, anybody can do it. You can do it too. He pointed to another cloud, like a little fluffy ball of cotton wool. Make that disappear. How? You just look at it, and do this. He twisted up his face as if scowling. Infected by their high spirits, I did as he said. I stared at the cloud, concentrated hard, and watched it dissolve. I looked at them accusingly. Did you help me? No, it wasn't necessary. You can do it. Look, try that one. He pointed at a bigger cloud. This time I took my time. I stared at it, and as I focused my attention, experienced an odd feeling that I can only describe as strength behind the eyes. I felt as if I were launching a javelin at it. After a few seconds, perhaps half a minute, it began to break apart, then dissolved. Now I knew that I was doing it without any help. I could feel a kind of momentary resistance from the cloud before it dissolved. Pavel said, You see, anybody can do it. We walked on to a McDonald's on the corner of Broadway. When they asked me to join them, I refused, saying that I had to get back. They were obviously disappointed, and so, in a sense, was I. But I had to be alone to think about what had happened. And as I said goodbye to Inga— Shaking hands in a formal continental manner, I knew she understood precisely why I was going. She could read my mind, and I didn't care in the least. It was pleasant to feel that someone understood what was going on inside me. There were not all that many clouds around that day, but on the way home I dissolved two more. After the second, I began to feel a kind of tiredness behind the eyes— which convinced me more than anything that this was real. Then it suddenly struck me. I was using my mind like a laser. I was focusing its powers down to a point, like focusing sunlight through a magnifying glass, then using that point to dissolve clouds, just as I could use a magnifying glass to light a match or cause a piece of wood to smolder. At that moment I realized that I knew something that the rest of the human race didn't know. Even the Vasilevskys didn't know it, for they did it without seeing its implications. It came as naturally to them as breathing. But I could see the implications. Perception isn't just looking, like seeing things reflected in a mirror. It is more like directing a fire hose at what you're looking at and seeing the water bounce off it in a spray. 
This spray is what we call perception. Another point struck me. Trask had said that a laser was only about five percent efficient. The same was true of the human mind. Human beings had simply not learned to focus the powers inside their own heads. And I was just beginning to learn. <laughs> it was a strange evening. I watched television and did some preparation for my classes the next day. But inside, there was the certainty that everything had changed. No matter what happened, no matter whether we uncovered the pre-Ice Age civilization of Antarctica or not, nothing would ever be the same again. That night, I made an equally important discovery. I was very tired when I went to bed, yet too excited to fall asleep immediately. So I lay there, deeply relaxed, feeling as I used to feel as a child, that marvellous, comfortable sensation of pure happiness, as if setting out on a voyage to Wonderland. Sometime during the night, I woke up having an absurd dream. I was standing near a hedge, talking to another man, perhaps a farmer. There were some tall weeds around us, and they seemed to have pods on them. The other man was eating something, and as the crumbs fell, the weeds were trying to catch them in their mouths. I seemed to recall the pods opened like beaks. This didn't worry me. It seemed quite natural. As I walked a few steps, one of the weeds followed me, pressing against my leg, almost tripping me up, hoping for food. I remember being mildly surprised that it could walk. I returned to the place where I had been standing— and the weed subsided. I woke up and thought, of course, plants are alive, just like us. It struck me that I ought to suggest to my father that he should test Inga to see whether she could communicate with plants. I continued to feel oddly relaxed and happy, as it struck me that the dream had been trying to tell me something. It was an interesting thought— that my dreams were not merely the confused leftovers of consciousness, but had a life of their own, like the walking plant. They were trying to instruct and entertain me. If I trusted them and allowed them to speak, they had a great deal to communicate to me, and I drifted back into sleep as if plunging into a warm sea. Strange and pleasant dreams continued all night, and as I woke up in the morning— the phrase dream force floated into my head. In its way, this was just as interesting as the discovery that I could make clouds disintegrate. My father liked the idea of testing Inga for ESP with plants, and when he started his tests with her, this was the first thing he tried. The results, published in the American Journal for Psychical Research, are impressive— on one occasion, she caused a tulip to grow from a bulb in less than nineteen hours, and leave no doubt that she could communicate with plants as easily as with her brothers. These tests took place in Trask's laboratory, at his invitation between eight and ten in the morning, when her powers were still fresh. From the beginning, the results were even more remarkable than those obtained by Voronsky. This was because he had restricted himself to the standard tests for ESP, xenocards, and so on. My father wanted to find out what else she could do. One day, after reading about a Russian psychic who could make a matchbox hang suspended in the air, he got her to try it. She succeeded in making a glass of water hang suspended between her open palms for more than a minute before it fell to the floor. The next day, when my father was late getting to the laboratory, he found her handling a large ruby crystal, a foot-long cylinder of ruby weighing about five hundred grams. She seemed to be fascinated by it, and asked him what it was. He explained that it was probably a ruby used in a laser. What is a laser? Since he was no expert, he tried to explain in non-technical language. She listened carefully, without taking her eyes off the crystal. When my father had finished, she held it between her palms, then carefully separated them. The ruby continued to hang suspended in the air. My father watched with increasing amazement as Inga continued to stare at the crystal, as if ordering it to stay where it was. 
Drops of perspiration ran down her forehead. My father had glanced at his watch when she separated her hands. Five minutes later, the ruby was still hanging there in the air. Then she gave a gasp, as if she had been holding her breath, and the ruby fell to the floor. My father was furious with himself for failing to record it on videotape, and asked her if she could do it again. She shook her head. Not today. I, I am too tired. Can you do that with other things? For example, this umbrella? No. It was something about that ruby. I felt it as soon as I touched it. It is on the same wavelength as my mind. At that moment, Bill Ruggles came in and asked if he could have his ruby. Ten minutes later, he was back. What did she do to that ruby? Why? Is there something wrong? Not wrong. Come and look. They followed him into his own room, where the laser was standing on a bench. It was a big metal cylinder, six inches in diameter and four feet long, rather like a large electric torch. The ruby crystal was inside it. Ruggle said, Watch this. He placed a six-inch cube of some copper alloy on a pad of asbestos at the far end of the bench, and another heavy sheet of metal-bound asbestos behind it. Then he switched on the laser. The pure red beam shot across the bench and struck the alloy. It should have bitten into it slowly, like a drill. Instead, there was a blinding shower of sparks that made them all jump, and the beam shot out of the other side of the block. There was another searing noise as it penetrated the asbestos shield. When Ruggles leapt forward and switched it off, the beam was already cutting a hole in the wall at the end of the bench. Ruggles said, What in the hell did she do to it? She shook her head. I don't know, but as soon as I touched it, I knew I could do something. Ruggles went and fetched Trask, who examined the block of alloy. The hole through it was an inch wide. Then he watched as Ruggles repeated the experiment, with the same astonishing results. This time, Ruggles switched off the laser, before it blasted a hole in the wall. Trask removed the ruby from the laser and examined it carefully. When he asked Inger if she knew what she had done to it, she shook her head. Trask handed it to Ruggles. Do a spectroscopic analysis and see if you can find what she's done. Inger asked, could I take it home with me? Trask looked surprised. Of course. But why? I'd like my brothers to see what they can do with it. By all means. But I doubt whether they can do any more. I'd guess that whatever you did, it's now operating at a hundred percent efficiency. In fact, Inga took another ruby crystal home. Trask was anxious not to let go of this one, until they knew what had happened to it. The next day— when she returned the crystal, she was wearing an odd smile. Trask asked her, What happened? Instead of replying, she took it back from him, suspended it between her hands, and then, without any kind of effort, opened her palms and left it suspended in the air. Trask and my father observed this for perhaps five minutes. My father noticed that she showed no sign of effort, none of the strain of the previous day. Then, instead of allowing the crystal to fall to the floor, Inga closed both hands on it and placed it on the bench. She said, You see, I knew I could do more with it. My father asked, But what did you do? She smiled. I don't know, but this time it is very strong. You must be careful with it. So Trask and Bill Ruggles spent half an hour setting up the experiment. They procured an even larger cube of copper alloy, I am told it cost a fortune, and clamped it so it could not move. Behind it, there was almost two feet of soft asbestos, soft because a laser cuts into the material by causing the atoms to vibrate, and a softer material is more resistant, on the same principle as firing a bullet into cotton wool. This time the cube exploded into sparks— and the laser punched its way through the asbestos and the wall behind it. If Bill Ruggles had not been poised to switch off the current, it would have knocked a hole in the outer wall of the building. When they had recovered from the shock, Trask told my father, 
You can tell Matthew we've solved the problem of cutting through half a mile of ice. It proved not to be as simple as that. When they looked at the ruby crystal, it had shattered into a dozen fragments, in spite of which Trask was sufficiently confident to phone me that evening and ask me if I would like to accompany an expedition to Antarctica in three months' time. What exactly did the Vasilevskys do to the ruby crystal? I have to admit that we are still not certain. Trask believes that they were somehow able to affect its molecular structure. In the 1970s, Trask had been present at the Inserm Telemetry Laboratories in the Foch Hospital in Soren, France, when they were testing the psychic Uri Geller. One of the experiments involved a strange alloy called nitinol, which has a molecular memory. A nitinol wire can be squashed into any shape, but if subjected to heat or cold, will instantly straighten out again. Trask held a piece of nitinol wire stretched tight between both hands, while Geller stroked it. When Geller removed his hand, the wire now had a kink in it. Trask then dropped the wire into boiling water, expecting it to spring back into shape. In fact, it bent at a right angle, and all Trask's later efforts failed to straighten it out. Geller had somehow affected its molecular memory. Even melting the wire in a furnace failed to straighten it out. Trask believed that the Vasilevskys had done something of the sort to the ruby. His own explanation went roughly like this. The color of precious stones, like ruby, sapphire, emerald, is due to impurities in the crystal. Ruby is made from a crystal of aluminum oxide, or corundum, which is as transparent as water. But it has an impurity— a few chromium atoms which absorb all colors but red. It is these impurities which enable rubies to act as lasers. When a ruby is bathed in ultraviolet light, which is invisible, it soon begins to glow as the chromium atoms store up energy, which they quickly release in the form of red light, rather like a compressed spring being released. The waves of this red light are all marching in step, so when the beam is amplified through mirrors at either end of the cylinder, and then focused to a small spot, it is a million times as strong as ordinary light, and has the power to cut through metal. Whatever Inger had done had somehow altered the structure of the molecules in the crystal, causing its atoms to store far more energy than usual. So, instead of operating at five percent efficiency, it operated at something closer to one hundred percent. I lacked the scientific knowledge to dispute this view. But even then it seemed to me too simple. To begin with, even if the laser now operated at one hundred percent efficiency, it would only be twenty times as powerful as when it operated at five percent. And I know from having seen it in action that the Vasilevskys had amplified the power of the laser more than twenty times. So what is my own view? It is based on the simple fact that if you keep on doubling a number, it soon reaches an astronomical size. There is a story of a Chinese emperor who wished to persuade a philosopher to take up residence in his court, and asked him to name his own price. The philosopher replied, Please pay me in corn. Ask your treasurer to take a chessboard, and place on its first square one grain of corn. On the second, two grains. On the third, four grains. On the fourth, eight grains. And so on, doubling the number of grains each time. The emperor's first reaction was to say, But surely you deserve more than that. Until he began to work it out, and realized that by the time he had doubled one grain of corn sixty-four times, the total would be more than all the grain in his kingdom. Now the simplest maser, you may recall, consists of ammonia gas, and every time a microwave hits a molecule, it gives off another microwave. Then the two microwaves hit two more molecules, and produce four microwaves, and so it goes on, doubling each time. In theory, an ordinary maser ought to produce more power than a hydrogen bomb. Of course, this does not happen, due to the inefficiency of the process. In my view, Whatever the Vasilevskys did to the ruby crystal changed its structure, 
so that it began to double its power output over and over again. They may have changed the structure of the chromium molecule so that the photon was deflected from one to another, enabling it to create the doubling effect. Or they may, of course, have introduced some new principle into the process, perhaps some vital energy that science fails to recognize. All this was another example of the extraordinary synchronicities that had been pursuing me since I had met Trask at the science club. It was my chance meeting with Inga in Trask's laboratory that had led to the solution of the laser problem. My father admitted to me that he was not interested in testing psychics, and only changed his mind as a result of meeting Inga when I brought her back. Three. My decision to skip a semester and go to Antarctica led to my breakup with Coral. She had planned our wedding for the week after I graduated, and persuaded her favorite uncle to offer me a job in advertising. When I went to tell her that Trask had offered me a place on the expedition, I expected her to be as excited as I was. Instead, she looked at me in a stunned sort of way and asked if I realized that this would delay our marriage by at least a year. I said this wasn't true. We could get married whenever we liked, even before I set out. She simply didn't see my point. As far as she was concerned, I was throwing away my career for a romantic daydream. What amazed me was that she even bothered to try to influence me. It made me suddenly aware how little we had in common. Up until that point— I had believed I was in love with her. I certainly had felt she was one of the most attractive girls I'd ever met. But the moment she tried to persuade me not to go to Antarctica, I fell out of love. When she said, If you go, we're through. I said, OK, we're through. And as I walked out of the room, was amazed that I didn't feel the least pang of regret. I think that if Trask had not invited me to join the expedition— I would have made my way to Antarctica on foot. In effect, Trask had invited me along as the office boy or gopher. When my grandmother asked me what I was supposed to do, I said I didn't know. In fact, I have never worked harder than in those three months between July and early October, when our plane took off for Little America. I used to arrive at Trask's apartment, at the top of the building above the lab, at eight in the morning, and find him dictating to his secretary a list of all the things I had to attend to. The secretary, Charles Schmidt, had been with him for fifteen years, ever since a female secretary had been indiscreet about one of his inventions, with a new boyfriend who turned out to be a private detective hired as an industrial spy. Trask was determined never to let it happen again. I was sworn to secrecy about the real purpose of the expedition. As far as the press was concerned, our purpose was oil exploration. Even his friend, Colonel Leroy of the U.S. Air Force, who obtained the permission to use Little America as a base, was not told the true reason. Trask knew that if the press found out, we'd be pursued by a plane load of reporters. He also told everybody who knew about the laser experiment to refer to it simply as the supercharged laser. Under no circumstances was anyone to breathe a word that we were using the Vasilevskys. The Vasilevskys, of course, had to be told, since they were, to put it mildly, a crucial part of the operation. Although the second ruby crystal had shattered, the first one was still working, but it was obviously less than half as powerful as the one that the whole family had charged, and now Trask had them working on rubies seven days a week. For this, he paid them far more than they had ever earned as an acrobatic team. He also moved them to a suite in the Waldorf Astoria. One of my tasks was collecting the cylinders, and I often had the opportunity to see how the family worked. They sat in a darkened room, the ruby on a small round table, nesting in the middle of a piece of green velvet that was one of Natalia's old ballet costumes. All four sat around it placing their fingertips on the crystal and staring intently. The room became totally silent. Then, it seemed to me, the ruby became brighter. When that happened, 
they all simultaneously released their breath and relaxed, and the ruby was ready to be taken back to the laboratory. On my third day there, Pavel said, Why don't you come and help? I thought at first that he was joking, until he drew up another chair. I said, Are you sure that's a good idea? But he merely gestured at the chair. So I sat down and joined in. I frowned at the ruby, and tried to summon the same sense of power behind the eyes that could make clouds dissolve. Looking into the ruby was a strange experience, for after a few seconds I seemed to be somehow drawn into it, until it filled my consciousness. Moreover, there was a strange sense of resistance. I can only compare it to wading through water. Then the red glow became brighter, and I felt the resistance disappear. When I released my breath and relaxed, I felt as tired as if I had climbed a dozen flights of stairs. It was far harder work than dissolving clouds. On the first day I did this, Bill Ruggles tested the ruby, then shook his head. It seems weaker today. Instead of punching a hole through a block of metal, it took about ten seconds to drill through it, making a faint sputtering noise. Naturally. I wondered if I was responsible. But after several more attempts, I realized this was untrue. Some days, the force exerted by the Vasilevskys was so powerful that it took only a minute or so to change the ruby. On other days, it might take ten minutes or so. I also noticed that the quicker it took, the more spectacular the results, and the more likely the ruby was to fly apart. I should add that I never told Trask or Bill, or even my father, what I was doing. I had a feeling that this should be my secret. So were the dreams. Most nights I came back to our apartment late. I quickly fell into the habit of all Trask's employees— and began working around the clock. Usually, I fell asleep as soon as my head touched the pillow. But usually I woke up at three or four in the morning, and lay there on my back, experiencing a pleasant, peaceful sensation, like lying in a boat on a slow river on a summer day. Then, as I drifted back into sleep, I began to experience the dream force, a glow of expectation— like sitting in a theatre waiting for the curtain to go up. Then I plunged into a world of dreams, sometimes delightful, sometimes strange, sometimes weird, sometimes even frightening, yet always fascinating. Even the frightening dreams were not nightmares, for I experienced no real sensation of fear, except once when I dreamed I was in a world of intelligent snakes, for whom human beings were a special delicacy. The dreams were like a form of entertainment, organized by some dream master with an endless stock of incredible tales. Naturally, I dreamed again and again of Antarctica and Windy Gap. The dreams were always the same. The snow was bright and sparkling, like the snow on Christmas cards, and the place was magical, like a scene out of some fairy tale about the Snow Queen. The sky was always beautiful, sometimes green, sometimes blue, sometimes pink. Somewhere over to the east there was the giant crater that Admiral Byrd had flown over, but I never saw it. It was merely there in the background, a part of the mythology of this wonderful place. Some of these dreams were so real that there was a sense of coming home, as if I were returning to the scene of a previous life. I had a feeling that In some strange way, I had inherited my grandfather's dream about the future. What puzzled me was that it had only happened after I had become fascinated by Antarctica. The day we set out was bright and clear. We were flying from an airfield near Poughkeepsie, in a transport plane that belonged to the U.S. Air Force. So great was Trask's influence with the present administration. Poughkeepsie had been chosen for the sake of avoiding publicity— No editor in America could suspect that anything important could be happening around Poughkeepsie. From the moment I woke up that morning, I had that happy, bubbling feeling that I used to feel as a child, when my father loaded up the car and we prepared to set out for Florida. Of course, 
Everyone has experienced this sense of holiday euphoria, and we make the natural assumption that it is simply a feeling of pleasant anticipation. Now I could see that this was a mistake. The holiday feeling was a sense of freedom, and this freedom was somehow far more important than a mere holiday. It was the feeling that life is infinitely more interesting and exciting than we realize. And as we traveled on the hired bus from New York to Poughkeepsie, I could see that this was no illusion. It was like a glimpse of the truth, like finding the key to a problem that has troubled you for a long time, and that you now suddenly know how to solve. It was far bigger than mere happiness, which seems trivial by comparison. During most of the ten thousand mile flight to the other side of Antarctica, which lasted for almost twenty hours, the feeling stayed with me. There were moments when it seemed too good to be true, but I only had to concentrate my attention, and experience the curious sense of power behind the eyes, to know that this was no illusion. The next morning, as we flew over that endless white landscape between the Weddell Sea and the Ross Ice Shelf, the excitement was almost intolerable. It seemed incredible to be looking down on the land that may have been the cradle of civilization. But I knew that whether or not we found Hapgood's pre-Ice Age civilization was unimportant. What was important was what I had learned in the process of looking for it. My first sight of Little America was a disappointment. Standing in the icy west wind, I looked around at this endless flat white landscape, illuminated by an enormous red sun resting near the horizon, and thought, My God, is this all? Then I had to galvanize myself into activity. Anyone but Trask would have allowed us to retire to bed after a twenty-hour flight. But he was a demon of energy, and he expected everybody else to be the same. Our team of eight, which had spent five hours loading the plane— now had to unload it, with some help from the servicemen. We were not finished until late that afternoon, when, of course, the sun was still hovering near the horizon, and everything looked exactly the same as when we landed, except, of course, that it was now on the opposite horizon. I had no complaints about the warmth of our welcome, or the hospitality of Colonel Leonard Lefty Leroy, and I suspected that the personnel were so glad to see strange faces— they would have welcomed us if we had been one-eyed cannibals with filed teeth. The party went on until after midnight, and even Trask was persuaded to drink a glass of brandy and water. But when the meal was over, I noticed Trask and Leroy seated in a corner, talking seriously, and knew immediately that Trask was finally telling him the truth about why we were there. It was only a few moments later that I noticed that I had known with total certainty, what they were talking about. We were up after a few hours' sleep, for there was a great deal to be done. The materials for our living quarters had been sent on ahead by helicopter, but only the storage shed had been erected. We had to do the rest ourselves, assuming the weather permitted. After an uncomfortable six-hour flight in transport helicopters, we landed at the foot of Mount Holyoke at four in the afternoon. The temperature was several degrees below zero, and the sky had turned grey. Even with the help of the team Leroy had lent us, it took seven or eight hours to erect the huts. Trask worked as hard as anyone, although he had chosen two of the team, Chet Morrison and Elmo Yarnefelt, for their sheer size and strength, and our cook, Dave Eng, who worked in the laboratory as a kind of unofficial security guard and caretaker, was bigger than either of them. We ate dinner at two o'clock in the morning, although it might as well have been midday as far as the sun was concerned. My own small, bare hut contained nothing but a camp bed, a chair, and my unpacked luggage, although the fan heater, powered by atomic batteries developed by Trask, kept the place agreeably warm. A few hours later, I woke up suddenly with a strange sense that I was not alone but the daylight in the room made it clear that I was mistaken. I closed my eyes, and again experienced the feeling that I was not alone. I sat up on my bed and peered out of the window. 
As far as I could see through the ice crystals, there was no one out there. There were still three hours to breakfast, so I decided to go back to sleep. But as I lay there in that deep silence, broken only by the almost inaudible sound of the fan heater, I became aware of something that made me turn on my back and open my eyes. I had suddenly, and with total certainty, become aware that I was not there by chance. I knew, of course, that a certain chain of events had brought me there, a chain that began with the visit of Admiral Byrd to the Winchester Geographical Society in 1930, and that included my grandfather's visit to this place where I was now lying in bed. But I was not there through some complex logic of events. I knew now that I was there because I had been summoned there. Now whoever or whatever had summoned me was establishing contact. I lay there for perhaps half an hour, waiting for something to happen. During all this time, I continued to feel that I was not alone. A Scottish aunt of mine had once told me how she had slept in a haunted room, and awakened with the feeling that there was someone in the room. She had said that the room was freezing cold, and that she had had a feeling that there was a presence watching her from the end of the bed. She had rushed out and spent the night in an armchair downstairs. But my room was warm, and I felt no sense of alarm, just the undeniable certainty that I was not alone. Then I relaxed, and as I drifted into sleep, I felt the dream force take over. This was not a lucid dream, so I cannot remember its exact details. All I can remember is that urgent sense of someone communicating with me, but failing to make me understand. In a sense, it was rather like Trask's lecture, simply above my head. Something, someone, was trying to tell me something about travelling through space, but it made no sense. As far as I could understand, it was space itself that was moving, in a kind of stream. When the stream encountered something solid, like a meteor, it flowed into eddies around it, and turned into waving tentacles, like water flowing over a stone. This force had encountered our earth, and had been attracted by its living aura. The earth itself was alive, but in a dull, unconscious way, like someone deeply asleep. But the mountains, standing out above the earth, were more alive than the rest. So this space force entered into the mountains, making them more alive. At this point, I began to dimly understand. Mountains, of course, were the primal beings. It seemed perfectly obvious. Mountains were attached to the earth from which they sprang, so they could draw upon its vitality. This is why the most primitive religion was the worship of mountains, for ancient man sensed that the mountains were alive. It is no figure of speech to talk about the roots of the mountains. They have roots, like trees or plants, and the roots draw upon the living force of the soil. All this brought with it a most wonderful sense of awe and happiness. It was like great music or great poetry. I was being told something that made sense of life and of the universe, and in my dream it all seemed perfectly clear and obvious. For example, this was why hermits lived in caves on the mountains. They drew strength from the vital aura of the mountain. Why should we be trapped inside our bodies and our minds like prisoners in a cramped cell, when we could share the life of the mountains? At this point, something woke me up. I think it was somebody slamming the door of the storeroom, which we had converted into a kitchen and dining room. But I didn't want to wake up. I wanted to go on dreaming. Within a few seconds, I was asleep again. The communication continued, confirming my certainty that this was not a dream. I was seeing the primitive earth as it had been before the simplest living organisms made their appearance. The seas were hot, and covered with thick mist. Every valley was full of mist. Only the mountains stood out above it. But the water could also absorb the living force. 
and as the seas cooled and the mist vanished, they began to absorb sunlight, and to swarm with tiny green creatures, like the algae on a pond. Now the mountains began to mold this life into more complex forms. They literally began to create living creatures, tiny wriggling groups of cells. And the larger groups of cells absorbed the smaller ones, making themselves bigger to become the first predators. Of course, these tiny organisms were not in charge of their own life force. They could easily be destroyed. Only the mountains were independent, indestructible. Millions of years passed, and the soil in the valleys absorbed the sunlight, and began to produce bright green moss. The mountains guided the development of this moss, so that it put down roots, and began to grow into more complex forms like grass and ferns. It was at this point that the mountains began to understand the disadvantages of being rooted to the same spot. The earth and the seas were now teeming with life, only they were unable to move. So now they developed the power to concentrate their life into eddies, and then to mold the crude matter around them into organic forms. The simplest of these forms was the limpet that sticks on rocks by the seashore. This is made of a tough, durable flesh, with a consistency not unlike leather, protected by a rock-like shell. The first embodiment of independent life on earth, life that has no fear of distraction, was a giant limpet that could move about on its retractable base. I was awakened by the gong summoning us to food. I could see from the window that the sun had moved westward along the horizon. As I dressed, I found the room oppressively hot, and then realized that this was because my body was so cold. I had to plunge my hands into hot water to warm them. I wondered if I should tell Trask or Bill Ruggles what I had seen. The answer came back immediately, almost as if a voice had spoken in my head, and the answer was no. Thinking about this, I saw it was common sense. What could I tell them? That I had been dreaming about the origin of life on earth? They would wonder why I thought it so important. Outside, I was startled by the cold. During the night, the temperature had dropped by about ten degrees, and before I reached the dining room, my face and fingertips felt frozen. We ate a large breakfast of bacon, eggs, tomatoes, and hash brown potatoes, with orange juice and coffee. Trask was in brilliant form, talking with marvelous fire and enthusiasm. He was often silent and withdrawn, almost morose, but this morning he was obviously full of excitement, and he made the rest of us feel it. We set out about eleven o'clock. Unlike the IGY expedition, we had no dog sleds, only one huge snow tractor with a trailer that had been brought from Little America. This carried the sonar equipment and two laser guns, which looked less like guns than cannons. I walked behind with Trask, Bill Ruggles, and Elmo Yarnefelt. We were all wrapped in furs until we looked like polar bears. Under this, we were wearing electrically heated tracksuits, designed by Trask. But the heating did not extend to our boots— and soon my feet were freezing. The ground underfoot was solid ice, and we had to tread cautiously. The scenery was magnificent, with Mount Holyoke towering above us, the Robertson Plain stretching eastward to Mount Foray, which was clearly visible in the transparent air, and the Rockefeller Range glittering against the sky in the northwest. The sky overhead was dark blue, the head of Windy Gap was a mile away, to begin with partly hidden behind the forty-five-degree slope of Mount Holyoke. What surprised me was my sense of familiarity. Usually, a place is quite different from your imagination of it, but this looked exactly as I had imagined it. And when finally we rounded the slope and looked southwest along Windy Gap, it looked exactly as it had in my dreams. I was not surprised— I now knew beyond all doubt that I was not there by accident. This feeling 
that destiny was working in my favour, filled me with a glow of confidence and certainty. The total conviction that we were on the point of some major breakthrough, I could sense intuitively that everyone felt exactly as I did. The snow tractor had halted about a mile along Windy Gap, in precisely the place I had expected, just as I had known it would. This, I knew, was the place where, in his dream, my grandfather had seen the Cyclopean city. Chet Morrison was already working with the sonar, while Bill Ruggles was setting up the laser in the back of the trailer. At this distance, it resembled an astronomical telescope. Trask, wearing a tartan scarf and a baseball cap, looked not unlike a coach in charge of an ice hockey team. The most important part of our equipment was the atomic energy source. Trask was the first person to create a portable atomic energy generator. And even so, it weighed a quarter of a ton, and took two men to handle it. As we arrived, Chet Morrison, without speaking, handed Trask the computer simulations. Trask studied them, handed them back, then said, OK, let's get started. We all moved to the rear of the snow tractor. The atomic motor was humming softly, almost silent, although it could produce enough current to light a small city. At the last moment, Elmo Yarnefelt, who was going to film all this, called, Wait a moment, this thing is affected by the cold. We waited in silence for perhaps five minutes. Nobody spoke. At that point, there was nothing to say. Then Yarnefelt said, it's rolling. Bill Ruggles said, I'll try her on half. That meant fifty percent of the possible energy output. Almost instantly, the intense ruby beam, three inches wide, knifed out of the laser gun like a bar of red-hot steel, and struck the ice. There was a violent hissing that made us all jump backward, and suddenly we were engulfed in steam. Then there was an explosion— and even more steam. Trask shouted, "'Turn it off!' As the steam cleared, we all ran forward to look. What we saw was an anticlimax. At first there was no sign that anything had happened. Then, at the point where the laser had struck the ice, we saw the small hole, still steaming like a geezer. Somebody said, "'What was that explosion? The steam trying to escape.' It forms pockets, like trying to cook an egg in a microwave oven. It was disappointing. That enormous volume of steam and the noise that went with it had merely produced a three-inch hole, which was slowly widening as steam continued to hiss out of it. Yarnefelt, walking a few yards beyond the hole, said, Look, the ice is cracked here. The explosion did that. Bill said, Thank God I didn't try it on full power. It would have blown us sky high. Now, suddenly, we could all see the problem. The laser would cut through the ice to any depth we liked, but it would convert it into high-pressure steam. Even now, this was falling back on us in the form of freezing rain, and we would still be left with only a three-inch hole. Trask, never one to be discouraged, said, Let's try one more and see what happens, and move the beam around like a water jet. This time we stood well back. Again there was a deafening hiss, and we were enveloped in a cloud that soon became as thick as pea-soup fog. Because it was a windless day, the mist simply surrounded us. We were quickly soaked by the condensing droplets. There were several explosions, one so violent that Bill jumped backward and fell off the trailer. The steam roared out of the hole in the ice, like the jet from a fire hose. The result, when we finally examined it, was more satisfying than before. The hot steam had enlarged the mouth of the hole to more than two feet. But as we stood looking, the partially melted ice collapsed inward like soft snow. In effect, cutting a hole through ice was like trying to cut a hole through water. The heat would cause the surrounding ice to collapse inward. It seems absurd that none of us had foreseen this, but I think we all had had the same attitude. Let's try it and see what happens. We were all soaked to the skin, 
and it was obvious that we had to get back and change before we froze to death. We all piled into the trailer, and Chet drove us back at thirty miles an hour, bumping violently up and down like peas on a drum, but too cold to care. I struggled out of my clothes, which were now like stiff canvas, and turned up the heater. Dave Eng brought me hot soup, which soon restored me to normal. After that, I dressed in dry clothes, and, since my room was filling up with steam as the wet clothes dried out, went across to the dining room. Trask was sitting alone at the table, drinking orange juice. He never took stimulants like tea or coffee. To my surprise, he looked cheerful. "'Well, Matthew, what do you think? That we have to wait for a windy day. Right. The wind will solve the problem of the steam. Second, we have to stick to the surface and cut down at an angle against the face of the mountain. I calculate it should take us about a week to reach those blocks.' He had worked out on a sheet of paper the number of calories it would take to dissolve ten million tons of ice, and decided that, at full strength, the laser could evaporate more than a hundred thousand tons a day. Having seen the amount of steam generated in less than half a minute, I could believe it. His optimism was infectious, and what he said was obviously true. Since there was no point in drilling down into the ice— we had to concentrate on evaporating its surface over a fairly small area. If the wind carried away the steam, there was no reason to anticipate any further problems. That afternoon, the wind sprang up. This time, only Trask, Bill Ruggles, and myself went to Windy Gap, leaving the others to work on the huts. Electric lights still had to be installed, and the hot showers— the wind chill factor sent the temperature down to ten below, and all three of us kept to the shelter of the trailer, whose high sides made it windproof. Bill directed the beam at the surface at an angle of no more than a few degrees. The result was spectacular. There was a hiss, and the surface of the ice turned into clouds of white vapor to be carried away by the wind, which must have been blowing at fifty miles an hour. It was very satisfying to see the great clouds carried away until they turned to water droplets and disappeared. We went to survey the result at close quarters and were impressed. Because the angle was so small, the superheated steam had dissolved the ice above it, so there was a trench about a foot wide and up to two feet deep, up to the point where it vanished from sight. The power of the laser was awe-inspiring. It felt rather like unleashing a small atom bomb. Next, Bill turned the trailer at an angle and fired toward the mountainside. Again, it gouged out a foot-wide trench that went on into the rock for ten feet. By the time we had made half a dozen similar trenches, our progress was obvious. The laser had also made a ten-foot-deep cavern in the rock, but by using the laser in short bursts of ten seconds— Bill prevented it from cutting deeper. We had no desire to cause the side of the mountain to collapse. It was an oddly exhausting activity, releasing such savage and destructive bursts of energy. I was almost deaf from the explosive hiss. The same thought occurred to all three of us, that used as a weapon of war, the supercharged laser would make a ground attack obsolete. Bill began to move the beam back and forward like a fire hose, and the result was even more satisfying. The ice simply dissolved away. Soon, we had a hole fifty feet deep and a hundred yards wide, with several feet of water in the bottom. But as we paused to drink hot soup, we could see the problem. The hole looked enormous, big enough to hold a dozen buildings— but fifty feet was only a fiftieth part of half a mile. If we were going fifty times as deep, then we would have to keep moving back until we were on the far side of the valley. To dissolve this much ice, even with a supercharged laser, was like trying to drain a lake with a bucket. The alternative, of course, would be to cut a wide tunnel down into the ice, at an angle of perhaps thirty degrees. But that would obviously be dangerous— for the explosions of steam would crack the ice, and the whole tunnel might simply collapse with us inside it. 
and at an angle of thirty degrees, a tunnel that reached a depth of half a mile would have to be several miles long. It would take months. Trask had another suggestion. If we simply concentrated on cutting a hole straight down into the ice, at an angle of sixty degrees or even more, we could probably reach a depth of half a mile within days. It would be necessary to make sure that the hole was at the side of the blocks we were looking for, otherwise we might destroy them. Then, once we had our hole, the laser could be taken down to the bottom, and could begin to cut sideways into the ice. It would be dangerous, but workable. Another problem, of course, would be that steam rising from a depth of half a mile would not necessarily reach the surface. Much of it would turn to water and run back into the pit. And, if we vaporized the water with the laser, it would simply do the same thing all over again. I must admit that when we returned to camp at six o'clock, my optimism had started to evaporate, and even Trask looked grim. The amount of work we had done was tremendous. When the others walked down to look at it, they were amazed. But compared to what remained to be done, it was absurdly small. Later that evening, Bill brought more bad news. Toward the end of the afternoon, even I had noticed that the results were growing less spectacular. It seemed to take longer bursts to achieve the same amount of evaporation. I had assumed that this was because my senses were becoming accustomed to the explosions of steam. But checking with the laser's built-in computer, Bill verified that it had been working on less than fifty percent of its power. For some reason, the ruby crystal was losing its strength. This was not as serious as it might have been. To begin with, Bill had been using the laser at less than half its power. Second, we still had nine more ruby cylinders. Even using them up at a rate of one a day, they should cut through half a mile of ice. That night I slept normally and deeply, so deeply that I cannot remember any dreams. But when I woke up, I was once again full of energy and optimism. That day, there was again a strong wind, and the temperature was lower than ever. Again, only the three of us went to Windy Gap, while the others worked back at camp. We moved the tractor back another fifty feet, and continued to deepen the hole. It was slow work. Now the hole was so large it was harder to see the results. Moreover, the laser was fast losing its strength, and an hour later it shattered into a dozen pieces. Bill simply replaced it, and continued. At one o'clock we were tired and cold, and decided to let the others take a turn. Back at camp, Trask was half an hour late for lunch. When he finally came in, he told me that he had been speaking to Leroy in Little America. He had asked Leroy to telephone the Vasilevskys, and asked them to fly out to join us. In that way, we could manufacture more supercharged crystals on the spot. Leroy had said, what if they refused to come? Trask, with his usual confidence, had replied, They can't refuse. There's too much at stake. Trask proved to be wrong. An hour later, Leroy radioed to say they had refused. Rodion had told him they were happy in New York, had started a job in the Copacabana, and didn't want to fly to Antarctica. Rodion, I had often noticed, was stronger-minded and less obliging than the others. Trask said, "'Get him back on the phone and let me talk to him.' While we waited, he said, "'Come to think of it, you know them better than I do. You talk to him.' But it was Inga who came through on the crackly line. When I explained the problem, she said, "'But I don't understand. You must have more than a dozen. No, we have nine. Is that not enough?' "'It might be. It might not. Can't you persuade them to come?' "'I don't think so.' We've just started work, and the act is a great success. We don't want to let down the management. With Trask's eye on me, I did everything to persuade her. It made me unhappy, for I could understand why she hated the idea. Why should she want to change New York for Antarctica? Which I could now see would strike her as the most boring place in the world. She promised to try, and I said we would contact her that evening. When I talked to her again a few hours later, she told me that her brothers refused to come. 
but the act could do without her for a few weeks, and if it would help, she would come alone. As she said this, I wish she were in the room so I could hug and kiss her. There was something very gentle and kind about Inga. I began to suspect I might be in love with her. Trask was nodding enthusiastically, so I told Inga we would arrange her transport right away. Trask had a friend, the head of a business corporation, who owned two private jets, and owed him a favor. A few hours later, when the team returned from Windy Gap, we learned that the second laser crystal had shattered, and that they were now on the third. That evening, before I went to bed, I began to experience a curiously relaxed and dreamy feeling. I knew what this meant. Soon after supper, I excused myself and went to my room. As soon as I closed my eyes, I experienced the sense that I was not alone. It was so clear that I could feel a presence that pervaded the whole room. There was a strong sense of peace and serenity. Yet I felt no desire to sleep. I simply lay on my back with my eyes open, and waited for something to happen. It felt exactly like waiting for someone to speak. For perhaps a quarter of an hour, nothing happened, but I felt myself relaxing into a more and more deeply receptive state. Finally, I was so relaxed that I could hardly feel the beating of my heart. Next came a sense of great warmth and happiness, which seemed to be flowing into me, not originating inside me. I interpreted this as an expression of gratitude for what I had done. It was a delightful sensation, yet I experienced a certain impatience. What I now wanted to know was precisely what I was supposed to have done to deserve gratitude. Another ten minutes or so went past. I began to feel sleepy, and closed my eyes. I immediately experienced a sense of approval, as if this is what the invisible communicator wanted. I relaxed still more deeply, and began to experience the pleasant glow as the dream force invaded my consciousness. What followed was quite unlike my dream of two nights before. This was not a dream, but a series of insights, exactly as if someone was speaking to me without words. I must emphasize that the communicator did not tell me what I am now going to explain, except in the sense that a book tells you something you want to know. It was already there, laid out for me, like the maps of the ancient sea kings the Library of Congress laid out for Hapgood. All I had to do was to choose what I wanted to know. Within seconds, everything that had happened made sense. The communicators were not ghosts from Plato's Atlantis. They were creatures like ourselves, except that they were far more intelligent, and possessed far greater powers than human beings. Moreover, they had been on earth for millions of years, so long that their name for themselves was the First Ones. Then what had happened to them? What were they doing under the Antarctic ice? It was clear that they themselves did not know the answer to this question. They had been struck by a cold so extreme that there was no question of escape, even the Antarctic, where the temperature is often fifty degrees below zero, had never known such cold. Strangely enough, I was in a better position to understand it than they were. In Earth's shifting crust, Hapgood had discussed the mystery of the Beresovka Mammoth, discovered in the frozen bank of the Beresovka River, in Siberia, in 1901. It was removed by building huge fires to thaw the ground. Examination of its stomach revealed fresh buttercups that had not had time to digest. The mammoth had somehow been frozen instantaneously. Hapgood had approached the Bird's Eye Frozen Food Company to ask how they would freeze a mammoth so that even its stomach was frozen solid, and they admitted that they would find it almost impossible, for there is no known method of freezing it that quickly. Even in the coldest deep freeze, it would take days. Hapgood describes how the winter in northern Canada can arrive so suddenly that a lake in which he has just been swimming can freeze over in hours. But even that could not explain how intelligent creatures could be caught so unprepared that they were unable to escape. My own conviction is that there is only one way to explain how mammoths could freeze within minutes, or even seconds. 
Only the cold of outer space could produce this effect. For example, a tremendous volcanic explosion could eject gas and magma far out into space. When pulled back to Earth by gravity, it would be an icy gas whose temperature was close to absolute zero. The truth is that scientists still know nothing about what causes the Great Ice Ages. Every theory so far has proved inadequate. All we know is that they can arrive so suddenly that gigantic animals can be frozen solid so quickly that their meat remains edible when they are unfrozen thousands of years later. This, apparently, is what had happened to the first ones, and it was the fact that they had a high resistance to cold that made them vulnerable. Their giant city had no form of artificial heating, for they were perfectly happy at temperatures well below zero. If the temperature dropped below that level, they simply induced certain biochemical reactions, not unlike our human ability to generate heat by shivering, which prevented them from freezing. The great cold that plunged their city close to absolute zero took them completely by surprise. Before they understood what had happened, their bodies had frozen solid, and still the temperature went on plunging. It would, of course, have killed a warm-blooded animal instantly. But the first ones were not warm-blooded. They were a kind of giant limpet. There is another factor that must be taken into account. Far back in the remote past, they had chosen their bodies. If they had wanted to, they could have vacated their bodies and created new ones. But this would have involved a tremendous effort of creation, and there was no time for this. So the first ones were trapped in a tomb of ice. There was nothing they could do but wait. One day, the Great Ice Age would come to an end, and they would be free again. It came to an end, of course, some fourteen thousand years ago. But by this time they were buried underneath a mile of ice in Antarctica. And since the beginning of the last Ice Age, about one hundred thousand years ago, Antarctica had moved further south. It had originally been three thousand miles closer to the equator. The Antarctic ice sheet vanished, and the coastal regions were populated by human beings who built ports. But for the first ones, the thaw never came. Windy Gap was then, as it is today, one of the coldest places in Antarctica, and it remained, like other inland areas exposed to the west winds, frozen solid, although the ice sheet melted away until it was only a quarter of a mile thick. It must have seemed to them an appalling irony when the thaw stopped and the new mini-ice age began in Antarctica about 5000 BC. When men began to visit Antarctica in the twentieth century, their optimism rose. Now it could only be a matter of time. You might say that the first ones possessed a kind of broadcasting system. That is, their minds could reach out to other minds, particularly in a state of sleep. When my grandfather came with the IGY team in 1957, they saw him as the saviour they had been waiting for. It was they who sent him dreams of a civilization below the ice, and filled him with that sense of urgency and expectancy that I knew so well. When the sonar located the remains of their observatory, they had no doubt that their troubles were over. But they had reckoned without the caution of the academic temperament. Their own minds worked on a principle of supralogic, which made this weariness quite incomprehensible. But they knew that their long wait was coming to an end. When I discovered Hapgood in my grandfather's library, and began talking about it to everyone who would listen, they saw me as their best hope so far, and began to concentrate on influencing me. That was why I woke every morning with this bubbling sense of optimism. The first ones were subsidizing my vital energies. When Trask came to lecture at Columbia, they saw their opportunity— that was why, in spite of my intention of going home, I found myself going back on campus. That was why, instead of rushing to the bar with the others, I went forward to speak to the lecturer, who had, to be honest, left me slightly bemused and bored. They knew that the moment Trask became intrigued by the problem of how to penetrate down through half a mile of ice, nothing would stop him until he had solved it. 
at this point. I felt that my brain had absorbed as much as it could take. As soon as this thought entered my head, I fell into a peaceful sleep. When I woke up, it was already eight o'clock. As I showered and shaved, I was surprised by my own calmness, for there could be no doubt that, when I considered the situation coolly and logically, it pointed to one absurd yet inescapable conclusion, that I was the most important member of the human race who had existed so far. After all, I was the first to learn of the existence of this age-old tragedy. Without me, this expedition would never have happened, and there could be little doubt that, when the first ones were freed from their icy tomb, the history of the human race would enter a new phase, its most important so far. As a child, I had often fantasized about what would happen if Martians, or some infinitely wise race from the stars, landed on earth and took over its leadership, how war and crime would vanish overnight, and how men would finally learn the secret of happiness. Now, incredibly, it was about to happen, and I had been chosen to play a decisive role in this transition to a new future. As I ate breakfast, and watched Trask drinking his decaffeinated coffee, I was surprised by the sensation of affection and loyalty that I suddenly experienced. Trask was not the kind of person who inspired obvious affection. There was something oddly detached about him, something slightly inhuman. Yet now that I was aware that his name and mine would be linked in all future history, I began to feel that we were as closely linked as family members. Of course, there was no question of telling him what I had learned— he would probably think that my mind had collapsed. Sooner or later, he would learn what I had learned. Then would be the time to tell him. Four. That morning, I returned to the site of the excavation, and was impressed by what had been achieved in twenty-four hours. Recognizing that the laser would have to be moved down into the ice as the hole deepened, Chet Morrison's team had started to cut a trench across the valley, with a gradually sloping ramp on one side. This meant that there was a wall of ice on the far side, already more than fifty feet tall. It also meant that the snow tractor could descend to the bottom of the ramp, and continue deepening the hole above what I now knew to be the remains of an observatory. This also had the advantage of sheltering us from the wind— which blew that day in gusts of up to sixty miles an hour. The steam rose straight into the air, and was blown away before it could even begin to condense. By the time we returned in the early afternoon, the hole was nearly two hundred feet deep, two hundred and fifty feet below the original ice level. That was about a tenth of the total distance to the valley floor, and an eighth of the distance to the observatory ruins. Chet Morrison's team would deepen the ramp by at least another fifty feet. At this rate, we might achieve our objective within two, possibly three, weeks. At six o'clock that evening, Bill Ruggles told me that Inga had landed at Little America an hour ago, and was already on her way by helicopter. At half-past seven, Chet Morrison's team returned an hour later than expected. The work had gone so well that they had stayed on— the ruby showed no sign of losing its strength. They had only given up because the wind had dropped and was no longer carrying away the steam. As they sat drinking coffee, I was struck by their air of immense optimism, and realized that, like me, they were being subsidized. Soon after nine, the clattering of the helicopter sent me rushing outside. I hardly recognized Inga as she climbed down the steps, swathed in furs— her face peering out of a white fur hood, looking rather like a Russian doll. I had forgotten how small she was. When I bent to kiss her, she shyly turned her cheek, then said with concern, "'But you are cold.' The pilot also delivered a dozen ruby cylinders. Dave Eng had cooked Inger a meal, but she said she was not hungry. I sat by her and watched her toy with it, and helped her by eating two sausages.' The others occasionally glanced across at her with obvious curiosity, 
With the exception of Bill Ruggles, no one had any idea who she was or why she was there, although they had all seen her back at the laboratory. Trask had not appeared. He was in his room, working on a calculation, and no one wanted to take the responsibility of disturbing him. When she had eaten and settled in her room, Elmo Yarnefelt had moved in with Dave Eng to make room for her. I asked her if she was tired. When she said no, I suggested going for a walk. As we tramped across the hard-packed snow, I asked her what she thought of it. She said, It is very beautiful, like Siberia, but I don't like such places. We walked on in silence to the end of Windy Gap. The sun, on its circular path around the horizon, had reached its westward limit, and lay there framed between the mountains, making them look bleak but very beautiful. We stopped, and I looked down at her face. She seemed preoccupied. I asked, What is it? She shook her head, and her face became troubled. I don't know. Would you like to walk further? If you like. But half a mile down the valley, she stopped. I would like to go back now. Are you tired? No. I did not press her to explain, and we walked back in silence. It was quite different from the meeting I'd envisaged, in which I'd intended to tell her about the first ones, and ask her advice on when I should tell Trask. Now, for some odd reason, there seemed to be a barrier between us, and the mere thought of telling her aroused a strange feeling of resistance inside me, as if this was somehow the wrong time and the wrong place. Back in the dining room, Trask had emerged from his seclusion. Typically, he had not even noticed the sound of the helicopter. When he learned that I had not explained the progress we had made, he immediately swept her off into a corner of the room to bring her up to date. I saw my presence was unnecessary, and went back to my room. I felt jumpy and tense, unable to relax. I lay down on the bed and began to place myself in a state of relaxation. It took nearly half an hour, confirming my feeling that there was something wrong, some kind of obstruction. But as soon as I felt the onset of the dream force, I knew that nothing had changed. The first ones were still there, still glad to communicate. Yet I could sense a mood of caution. They had waited so long for this moment. Now it was so close, they were afraid that there would be something to prevent it. A knock at my door made me jump as if a bomb had exploded. This is one of the dangers of sinking into a near-trance state. With my heart thundering in my ears, I hastened to open it. It was Inga, still dressed in the fur uniform that made her look like something out of a Russian fairy tale. She was holding a slim brown paper parcel, obviously a book. I am sorry. Your father asked me to give this to you. Ah, thank you. As she turned away, I said, Won't you come in? Are you sure I am not disturbing you? She sounded very formal. No. Please come in. As she stepped inside, she said, Ah, it is very cold in here. And I suddenly realized I had forgotten to switch on the heating. Oddly enough, I had not even noticed the cold in the room. Now I hastened to turn on the fan heater, then smoothed out the bed, and asked her to sit down. The room, of course, was very bare, with only the bed, one chair, and the trestle table. Did you not notice the cold? No. It seemed strange that she should pursue something so unimportant. Why? She looked at me strangely for a moment, then seemed to make up her mind. She said in a firm voice, There is something about this place that I do not like. I cannot stay. You can't stay? I was aghast. No, I must leave. And you should leave too. But why? There is something bad. That is why I could not walk down the valley. Here it is better because of the mountain. She gestured out of the window. But what's wrong? I don't know. But I noticed it as soon as I stepped out of the plain. There is something very bad here, something dangerous. I looked at her closely. What do you know about this? Only what I feel, and I feel frightened. I stood up and walked up and down the room. The situation seemed absurd, worse than that, insane. I sat down, 
and pulled my chair closer to her. Look, I have a lot to tell you. Please listen to what I have to say. Then make up your mind. She gazed into my eyes quietly, without speaking. As she did so, I experienced again that feeling I had known ever since meeting her, an odd kind of intimacy, almost as if we were brother and sister. In that sense of intimacy, the odd feeling of reluctance I had been feeling seemed to evaporate. If I had been trying to explain to Trask, or even my grandfather, I would have had to start with assurances that I was not insane, or on drugs. With Inga, it was unnecessary. She knew I would only speak the truth. I began by telling her about that feeling of electrical excitement I had experienced the day I found Hapgood's book in my grandfather's library, and about how I felt it incredible that something so important could have been ignored. As I told her about my dream on the night I had met Trask, and my certainty that I was going to play a major part in rediscovering the lost civilization, I found myself wondering why it had taken me so long to realize that all this was being engineered by alien and yet benevolent forces. Then I went on to tell her about what I had learned since I had arrived in Antarctica, how I had been in communication with the First Ones, and learned about the strange catastrophe that had buried them below half a mile of ice. As I described all this, I was certain that she would now understand and sympathize with these creatures who had been entombed for perhaps a hundred thousand years, like miners trapped in a tunnel under a mountain, trying to attract the attention of the outside world. Yet, when I had finished, she sat silent, staring at the floor. I said finally, Well? She said, I understand what you feel. Her reaction baffled me. Yes, but what do you think about it? But I think you are wrong. There is something bad about this. There is something wrong. I almost exploded in exasperation. Why? What do you mean? She shook her head. I don't know. I just feel it. But what could there be wrong? These poor devils have been down there for thousands of years. Are you saying we should leave them there? She shook her head, obviously miserable. I said, try to give me some idea of why you think they're bad. I'm not saying they're bad. I can only tell you what I feel. Please, try to explain. Inga was not an articulate person, but she made an effort. You say they are like miners who have been trapped, but have you read the story in the Arabian Nights about a fisherman who finds a genie in a bottle and lets it out? That stopped me short. What she said certainly made sense. I had seen a movie as a child in which someone opens the bottle he finds on a beach, and a wisp of smoke comes out, then gets bigger and bigger, until it turns into a man a hundred feet tall, towering above him as a human being towers above a mouse. Her comment made me aware of something that I had not thought about before, that the first ones would certainly have all the magical powers of the genie in the Arabian Nights. Once they were out, there would be no going back. Human history would be changed forever. But would that be such a bad thing? Throughout recorded history, human beings have been doing terrible things to one another. Even now, living in a world whose technology could provide for the needs of the whole human race and ensure prosperity for everyone, they are still more concerned with killing than with peace and happiness. The First Ones might stop them murdering and tormenting one another. I was deeply troubled. It seemed impossible to imagine what harm could come from releasing the First Ones from their prison. I said, I'll have to think about it. You probably need some sleep. She smiled palely. Yes, I'm very tired. You want me to go? No, not unless you do. She said, Can I stay here? Stay here? I stared in astonishment. I don't want to be alone. I made an attempt to reassure her. But you have nothing to be afraid of. I would like to stay here. She said it politely, but stubbornly. Well, all right, you can have the bed. No, I will sleep on the floor. We argued it out. Finally, it was agreed that I would fetch her eider down and pillow and sleep on the floor. 
Luckily, no one saw me staggering along with an armful of bedding. When I got back, she was already in bed, her furs on the floor. I made up my own bed, closed the curtains, and lay down on the floor. When I said good night, there was no reply. She was already asleep. But I had no desire to go to sleep. There was too much that I needed to understand. To begin with, why did Inga want to sleep in my room? She was not likely to be physically attacked. Was it simply a child's desire for safety and reassurance? That seemed unlikely. In the few months I had known her, she had always struck me as a self-controlled and adult personality. Second, what was she afraid of? When I told her about the first ones, I had expected her to understand immediately, to realize that she had merely sensed their presence below the ice, and that she had nothing to fear. Yet whatever was troubling her was clearly as strong as ever. At this point, I realized that Inga was having a bad dream. She was moving in her sleep and making faint noises in her throat. It made me think of my grandfather's dog chasing rabbits in its sleep. I got up quietly, stood by her, and placed a hand on her forehead. It was very cold. I expected her to wake up, but she remained fast asleep. But as I stood there with my hand on her forehead, she slowly relaxed. When she was breathing normally again, I shook her gently. But she continued to sleep. Either she was very tired, or she was in some kind of trance. Back in my own bed, I decided that the most sensible thing to do was to try to make contact with the first ones. Perhaps they could make me understand what was troubling Inga. I lay on my back and spent ten minutes relaxing deeply, but this time the dream force refused to come. It was like dialing a telephone number and getting no reply. At this point, Inga's breathing became irregular again. Again, I stood by her and placed my hand on her forehead, again surprised by its cold. This time, it took longer. I made myself relax deeply, and tried to transmit a sense of reassurance, and finally her breathing became even. I noticed that her forehead also became warmer. I dozed for an hour or so. Toward morning the wind sprang up from the southeast. Our camp was sheltered from the west winds by the mountain, but these were blowing from the Ross ice sheet and made the windows rattle, while a draught made it apparent that the hut had not been bolted together tightly enough. The noise made it impossible to hear Inga's breathing. At about five o'clock, just as I was beginning to doze, I was jerked awake by a sudden sense that something was wrong. I went to look at Inga, and found that she was hardly able to breathe. Her breath came in gasps, and her face was grey. I pulled my chair across to the bed, and laid my hands on her forehead. It was like ice— my attempts to soothe her had no effect. Ten minutes later, she was still breathing as if she had pneumonia. Finally, I pulled back the bedclothes, climbed in beside her, and held her tightly against me, pressing my cheek against her face until my own felt numb. She was fully dressed, and her body felt very thin. I had the feeling that if I could convey some of my warmth to her— I could awaken her from the nightmare that seemed to be convulsing her. It took a long time, it seemed an hour, but at last I had a feeling that she was aware of me in some dim, unconscious way. Her breathing slowly became calmer, then returned to normal, and her face became warm again. At the same time, the wind dropped, and the morning became very still. I went back to my own bed, and lay there on my back. Although I remained alert, I had a feeling that her nightmares were over. Once again, I tried to relax and contact the first ones, but it was still impossible. At that point, I decided to try another method. I stretched my body until all the muscles were tense, and tried concentrating hard. The effect was interesting— I began to feel the same odd sensation of power behind the eyes that I had experienced after dispersing clouds. 
It was so strong that I went to the door and looked outside. From horizon to horizon, the sky was grey. Now that the wind had dropped, everything was still. I selected an area of cloud, focused my attention on it, and then concentrated hard. There was an odd sensation of force behind my eyes, rather like the sensation we experience when pushing against a stalled car to get it into motion. In spite of this, nothing seemed to be happening to the cloud, but the sensation was so satisfying that I went on trying. Then I noticed a swirl of cloud at the spot where I was concentrating. Suddenly it parted, and I could see the blue sky beyond. A few seconds later, the hole had filled again. But now I know why it had taken so much effort. This was not a single cloud I was trying to disperse, but a whole bank of them, perhaps a quarter of a mile thick. It brought a surge of deep and intense satisfaction. I had realized that I didn't need the first ones to subsidize my vital energies. I could do it myself, by the use of the right kind of concentration. There was a sound behind me, and Inga was looking out of the door. I said, How are you feeling? Well, thank you. Did you sleep well? I think so. She yawned. Now I must go back to my room. I carried her bedding back to her own hut. Fortunately, there was still no one around. As I left her, making herself coffee, I said, Do you still want to leave? She wrinkled her nose. Perhaps. I hate it here. Will you come too? No, I have to stay until the job is finished. She thought for a moment, then said, Very well, I will stay too. After the vehemence of the previous night, her casualness puzzled me, but I was too glad she had changed her mind to press her about it. Back in my own hut, I made coffee, then lay down on the bed. It was strange that, after a night with so little sleep, I felt so wide awake. I noticed the brown paper parcel sent by my father, and tore it open. It contained a fairly bulky paperback called H.P. Lovecraft, A Centenary Appreciation, published by Brown University Press. My father had scrawled in the front of it, This might amuse you. I had heard vaguely of Lovecraft, but had never actually read him. I had an idea he wrote horror stories, and these have never appealed to me. This book consisted of a number of critical articles on Lovecraft, and a selection of his fiction. My father had also added a parenthesis. See page 347. Page 347 proved to be a story called At the Mountains of Madness. Then I saw why my father thought it might amuse me. It was set in Antarctica. The opening sentence read, I am forced into speech because men of science have refused to follow my advice without knowing why. It is altogether against my will that I tell my reasons for opposing this contemplated invasion of the Antarctic. The narrator was a scientist from Miskatonic University, who had taken part in a recent Antarctic expedition, he seemed to have the Bird 1929 expedition in mind. The author of the story had obviously gone to a great deal of trouble to learn all about Antarctica. In Lovecraft's story, a polar expedition finds a range of mountains higher than the Himalayas. An advance party discovers a cave containing barrel-shaped leathery beings with tentacles and membranous wings, frozen solid. At this point, the advance party loses radio contact with the base. The narrator leads an expedition to find out what has become of them. They locate the camp, but everyone is dead, torn and mangled in fiendish and altogether inexplicable ways. There is no sign of the barrel-shaped creatures with wings and tentacles. The camp lies in the shadow of mountains whose witch-like cones and pinnacles remind them of a cyclopean city of no architecture known to man. The narrator and his party investigate, and discover that it's a ruined city. On the walls of one of its immense buildings, they discover sculptured reliefs that tell them the story of its builders, how the barrel-like beings, the old ones, 
came from a remote star system in pre-Cambrian times and colonized the earth, creating human beings and animals as food. The slaughter at the camp, they learn, occurred when the old ones were attacked by the sled dogs and defended themselves. In the confusion that followed, all the men and dogs were killed. The narrator concludes, Poor devils! After all, they were not evil things of their kind. They were the men of another age, and another order of being. That awful awakening in the cold of an unknown epoch, perhaps an attack by the furry, frantically barking quadrupeds, and a day's defence against them, and the equally frantic white simians. Poor old ones! I began reading with a kind of amusement which soon turned into an odd sense of unreality, as if someone were playing an absurd practical joke. What I was reading seemed a kind of grotesque parody of the story of the first ones, but written in the style of 1930s pulp fiction. The knowledge of Antarctica seemed so precise that I wondered for a moment whether H. P. Lovecraft might be the pseudonym of somebody who had accompanied Bird on that expedition. A glance at the introduction soon convinced me this was not so. Lovecraft was a shy recluse who had spent most of his life in Providence, Rhode Island, wrestling with poverty, detesting the modern world, and writing horror stories as a kind of defiant escapism. He died of cancer in 1937, at the age of forty-six, and his stories were kept in print by his friend, August Erleth, who ran a small press in Wisconsin. The first essay in the book was by Durleth. On the very first page I was electrified by this comment. From his earliest childhood, Lovecraft experienced incredibly vivid dreams. In his own words, strange cities, weird landscapes, unknown monsters, hideous ceremonies, oriental and Egyptian gorgeousness, and indefinable mysteries of life, death, and torment. Many of these he introduced direct into his stories. Now, suddenly, I felt I understood. That was why Lovecraft's story sounded like, as he would have put it, a grotesque and blasphemous parody of the history of the first ones. His was one of the minds they had reached in their attempt to make the world aware of their predicament. I went on reading, now fascinated. Another story, called The Shadow Out of Time, is about a professor, naturally from Miskatonic University who falls into a trance that lasts for years, although as far as his colleagues are concerned, he has merely become an unpredictable eccentric. His alter ego studies magical works like the Necronomicon in the university library. Then, five years later, he awakens from a deep sleep, and is once again his former self. But he suffers from nightmares, in which he sees a strange city— of dark cylindrical towers, built of a bizarre type of square-cut basalt masonry, and tapered slightly toward their rounded tops. Nowhere in any of them could the least traces of windows or other apertures save huge doors be found. As I read this, my scalp tingled. It all sounded uncomfortably like the city of my grandfather's dream. A few paragraphs further on, He speaks about dreams of a place where the skies were almost always moist and cloudy. The far horizon was always steamy and indistinct, but I could see that great jungles of unknown trees and ferns lay outside the city. Again, I was reminded of my grandfather's dreams. The professor also begins to study forbidden books, like the Necronomicon and von Janst's Anasprechleichen Kulten, and learns that, according to ancient knowledge, mankind is not the first intelligent race on earth. Things of inconceivable shape had reared towers to the sky, and delved into every secret of nature, before the first amphibian forebear of man had crawled out of the hot sea three hundred million years ago. Only fifty million years before the advent of man, there had been a great race— in whose vast libraries were volumes of text and pictures holding the whole of earth's annals. These creatures, he learns, can travel mentally into the future, 
enter the mind of some other being, and displace it, while the displaced mind is sent back to dwell in the past. By this time, it is obvious to the reader that this is what has happened to the unfortunate professor. The members of the great race are immense cones, ten feet high, and with the head and other organisms attached to foot-thick distendable limbs. They move around like huge limpets, by expanding and contracting their bases. Years later, the professor is invited on an archaeological dig in the western desert of Australia, where are vast ruins of square-cut blocks. Wandering among the ruins, he finds the entrance to a tunnel, which leads to an underground city which seems strangely familiar. He finds himself in a library, whose hieroglyphed shelves he recognizes. He takes down a book, and in the light of his torch sees queerly pigmented letters, written in English in his own handwriting. This is where he had spent his missing years. The Shadow Out of Time had been Lovecraft's last story, written in 1935, shortly before he died of cancer. Here, as in at the Mountains of Madness, it is obvious that he feels considerable sympathy for the old ones. These are not horror stories. In fact, there is an obvious conflict between the horror story framework and the actual content of the story, which is closer to science fiction. I am not surprised that Lovecraft died when he did. He must have known that he had outgrown the feelings out of which he had created his life's work. What fascinated me most was this mythology of the old ones. It was obvious that Lovecraft had received insights very like my own, and in some ways even more detailed. Here I felt I might find a clue to what was puzzling me about these beings under the ice. But there was no time now. I had to find out what Trask wanted me to do today. He was sitting in the corner of the dining room, talking to Winger. As I took my breakfast and went and joined them, he flashed me a welcoming smile— then went on talking to Inga. He was explaining how, when we all got back to New York, he wanted her to cooperate on a series of tests to try to determine what she had done to the ruby laser crystal. Inga was nodding, her eyes lowered, but I could sense that she was less than enthusiastic. In fact, that the whole idea bored her. Trask, on the other hand, looked happier than I had ever seen him, a naturally introverted man. He was never a great communicator, but this morning he was full of excitement and optimism. I suspected that I knew the reason. When he paused for breath, I asked him what he wanted me to do that morning. He said he would like me to stay behind with Inga while she tried her transformative techniques on another ruby. This was what I had hoped he would say. After breakfast, I returned with him to his room and collected two of the ruby cylinders the New York laboratory had sent the previous day. Half an hour later, as Trask was leaving on the snow tractor, I took these, and my only chair, to Inga's room. She was already sitting at the table. She hardly glanced at me as I sat down opposite. When I asked her how she felt, she gave a very faint smile, and made a movement of her shoulders. The table was covered with a dark blanket. I laid one of the cylinders on this, then drew the curtain so the room was in half-darkness. Ready? She sighed. Yes. She placed both hands on the ends of the ruby, and I placed mine over hers. After a few seconds, there was the familiar sense of being drawn into it, as into a bright red universe. Within moments, it had filled my consciousness— once again, there was that strange sense of resistance, like wading through water. Now my mind and hers were united together in the joint effort. If Pavel, Rodion, and Natalia had been there, it would have taken only a few minutes. But there was obviously something wrong. Although my own powers seemed exceptionally strong, hers were obviously weak. When we took a break— at the end of five minutes, she was obviously tired. We made coffee, and she told me about their engagement in a New York nightclub, 
and how they had made more money in a week than they made in a year as a circus act in Russia. We decided to have another try, but something was puzzling me. Last night, she had been so vehement that there was something wrong. Now, it was as if she had totally forgotten about it. As we gazed into the crystal, and our minds were joined in concentration, I did something that I knew to be wrong. I deliberately probed her mind, to find out what she was feeling. It was wrong, because I was ignoring her right to privacy. She recoiled instantly. No! I said, what are you hiding from me? Nothing. Then let me see. She said, there is nothing to see. Then why not let me see? There is nothing to see. But when I took her hands and placed them on the ends of the crystal, she made no resistance. I placed my hands over them and gazed into the red universe. Then we concentrated together. I did again what I had done before. She flinched, but made no attempt to resist. Then, quite suddenly, I was behind her eyes. I had ceased to be myself, and was looking at the world from inside her body. If I had looked up, I would have stared into my own eyes, as if looking at myself in a mirror. Now, I knew she was telling the truth. She was hiding nothing from me. But that did not mean there was nothing to hide. When I thought about the first ones, there was a strange feeling of resistance. I withdrew my mind, and looked into her eyes. She said, Well, you were right. There is nothing to see. We sat there quietly for a few minutes. She said, Shall we continue? I said, No, I don't want to do any more at the moment. I'll tell Trask you were tired after your long journey. She nodded gratefully, glad of the chance to escape further effort. I stood up. If you need me, I'll be in my room. Why don't you rest? Thank you. But it was not her tiredness that made me decide to stop working on the crystal. As our minds joined together in concentration, it would have been impossible to conceal from her what I suspected, and that was the last thing I wanted. The first time I had probed her mind, she had resisted, naturally, for we all wished to preserve our inner privacy. But the second time, she had allowed me inside her mind. Although she had ceased to resist, I was still aware of resistance. That resistance was connected with my attempt to probe her feelings about the first ones. Like some traumatized child, she had induced a kind of amnesia about something that had terrified her. If I allowed her to suspect this, I would only be plunging her into even deeper anxiety. As I returned to my own hut, I had no doubt in my mind what had happened. While she had been asleep in the night, something had invaded her mind. I say, something, because at this stage I had no idea of what it was. But I found it impossible to believe that the first ones were responsible. All I could know for certain was that her mind had been seized and taken over. This is why her face had become so icy cold. Something had plunged her into a deep trance state. My presence there had made it more difficult for them, for, as I now realized, I had instinctively sensed that something strange was going on. That is why Inga had insisted on staying in my room. She sensed instinctively that she was in some kind of danger. Inga had been born into Soviet Russia in the Brezhnev era, and life had been hard. Her father, whom she had worshipped, had died after a long and painful illness, and her mother's death had been hastened by lack of food. There were many things Inga preferred to forget, many memories that she refused to allow into consciousness— so it was not difficult to manipulate her mind when she was in a trance. In effect, she had been hypnotized, brainwashed. For the moment, I felt it was safer to leave her that way. Back in my own room, I decided to make another attempt to establish contact with the first ones. I lay on my bed, and allowed myself to sink into a deeper and deeper state of relaxation. Yet, no matter how much I relaxed— Nothing happened. Again, I felt that something was obstructing me. 
After a quarter of an hour or so, I gave up and picked up the Lovecraft book. I had a feeling that he might be able to offer me a clue. The longest piece in the book was an essay by Fritz Lieber, called Lovecraft and Speculative Fiction. It was here that I found what I was hoping for, an account of Lovecraft's mythology of the Old Ones. According to Lovecraft, the Old Ones came to earth before the continents began to form, more than a thousand million years ago. They were barrel-shaped, and had five membranous wings. They had created cities on earth and under the sea, and created life for food. They also, says Lieber, created hypnotically controlled protoplasmic masses called Shoggoths, who were their servants. These Shoggoths eventually evolved mental powers that made them extremely dangerous to their creators. Lovecraft, says Lieber, is obviously against the Shoggoths, and in favor of the Old Ones. The next arrivals on Earth were cone-shaped beings, half animal and half vegetable, like the Old Ones. Next came a half-polypus race, called the Blind Beings. It was these blind beings who built windowless basalt cities, and who preyed on the cone-shaped beings. Then the great race came from space, from transgalactic Yith, took over the bodies of the cone-shaped beings, and drove the blind beings into caves under the earth. After this, during the Carboniferous Era, there was a serpent race, called the Volutions. Then, about a hundred and fifty million years ago, there was a great revolt of the Shoggoths against their masters, which the Old Ones eventually won. The glacial ages of the Cenozoic Era, our own era of mammals and human beings, worked great hardship on the Old Ones, who were driven out of their cities by the Shoggoths. After this, Lieber speaks about Lovecraft's future history, which is typically pessimistic, and obviously irrelevant to my inquiry. What was I to make of this tangled tale? Back in New York, I would have dismissed the whole thing as the fabrication of a neurotic romantic. Under the circumstances, this was impossible. Lovecraft knew more than he had suspected. He had obtained much of his material from dreams, and obviously made any changes that he felt increase the dramatic effect. But he knew about the first ones, even though he added the absurdity of membranous wings. Why should anyone need wings to fly through empty space? And he knew about the great windowless cities, which he says were built by the blind beings. The serpent-like volutions, I noted were a reference to creatures created by his friend, Robert E. Howard, so they could be dismissed. But how much of the rest of Lovecraft's mythology was true? I was struck by the number of references to the Shoggoths. To me, these hypnotically controlled protoplasmic masses sounded authentic. When a race is the master of the earth, it needs servants. Robots made of protoplasm would be ideal— I imagine them looking a little like jellyfishes, except that they would be almost shapeless. But why should the Shoggoths rebel against their creators? It seemed to me that I could make a good guess. A mass of crawling protoplasm would not make a particularly good servant, no matter how obedient. If it was to be truly useful, for example in building cities, then it would have to be turned into something with arms and legs, something that could move things and lift them. It would need to be given a brain that could make intelligent decisions. In fact, it would need to be given some degree of freedom. In effect, the old ones would have to build Frankenstein monsters. And I already knew the next step, from my own experience. An ordinary animal is basically a robot. It reacts to stimuli like a penny in the slot machine. It accepts the fact that it is made of matter, and that this matter is subject to illness and death. In fact, it accepts its own limitations. Human matter differs from animal matter in one basic respect. Human beings have always had strange and inexplicable ideas about spirit and God and eternity some timeless realm of being beyond the material world. They believe that they are something more than the matter. 
These strangely potent convictions have driven them to create monasteries and cathedrals, and religions in which men can strive to free the spirit from its bondage to matter. I had discovered by an accident that I could make clouds dissolve. I had learned that, after making them dissolve away, I experienced a peculiar feeling of power behind the eyes. My introduction to laser technology had made me aware that the mind itself is a laser. When its powers are brought into focus, and made to march in step like a platoon of soldiers, they proved to be far greater than we could imagine. I had caught only a glimpse of these possibilities, but it had taught me to recognize that human beings are quite mistaken to think of themselves as animals. The unknown powers of the mind mean that they are potentially gods. What had happened, I was fairly certain, is that, like me, the Shoggoths had also reached a point where they discovered the powers of their own minds. At that point, they rebelled against their creators. These placid old ones, half animal and half vegetable, moving slowly on their retractable bases rather like giant snails, must have struck their servants as boring and old-fashioned relics of the past, like slow-witted old men. The Shoggoths dreamed of freedom— what I found hard to understand is why the Old Ones did not simply offer the Shoggoths their freedom and allow them to go their own way. Perhaps by that time the bitterness of the Shoggoths was too great, or perhaps they didn't give the Old Ones a chance, perhaps they simply attacked. All this came to me as I lay on the bed reading Lever's essay. Yet it was not mere speculation. I had an odd feeling of knowing it. It also seemed to me that I now knew the truth about what lay under the ice. I had been assuming that only the old ones were waiting for their freedom. Now I was certain I was mistaken. Lieber, quoting Lovecraft, had said, The glacial ages of the later Cenozoic worked great hardship on the old ones, who were driven from their terrestrial cities by the Shoggoths. My grandfather had seen one of these cities in a dream— a city of windowless towers. It was almost certainly one of the cities that had fallen to the Shoggoths. Of course, the Shoggoths may have been destroyed by the catastrophe that had trapped the old ones in a frozen tomb. In that case, what had terrified Inga so much? What was now obstructing my attempts to establish contact with the old ones? The Shoggoths had to be the answer. What were they trying to achieve— that was also obvious. Until yesterday, they had had nothing to fear. All they had to do was wait until help arrived. Sooner or later, their freedom was inevitable. Now that Ingrid arrived, all that had changed. She had to be silenced. And what about me? Since I knew the truth, I was the greatest threat of all. I must admit that for a few minutes that thought made my heart beat unpleasantly fast. To calm myself, I went to the door and looked out across the white, flat landscape, at the sun hanging above the horizon. It all looked pleasantly normal. From the kitchen, I could hear the sound of pots and pans as Dave Eng prepared lunch. From the end of Windy Gap, great clouds of steam billowed on the wind— then turned into hail that lashed down on the ice. It was obvious that the rescue operation was going according to plan. That thought filled me with a sense of urgency. Somehow this operation had to be stopped, at least until we had time to assess the situation. But how? What would Trask say if I told him I had something important to tell him, and then warned him that he might be letting a genie out of a bottle? He would think I had gone insane particularly if I explained that the genie was out of an H.P. Lovecraft horror story. The thought made me smile, and made me aware that, in spite of everything, I was still feeling curiously optimistic. I could simply not believe that our expedition constituted a serious threat to the future of the human race. Ever since I'd met Trask, I'd experienced a sense of buoyant optimism— a feeling that something marvellous was going to happen. I found it impossible to believe that, 
it was all some delusion. Now, as I looked at the reflection of the sun on the ice, I still had a deep inner certainty that all was well. Half an hour later, the snow tractor returned. As Trask jumped off the back, I went to meet him. How's it going, sir? Very well, Matthew. Excellent. We've gone down another fifty feet. What about you? Not so good. Inga's too tired to do anything. He looked concerned. That's too bad. She needs time to recover. Tell her to rest as long as it takes. As he started to go toward the dining room, I said, There's something else. He turned back. What else? It's not just that she's tired. You're going to think this sounds absurd, but she feels that what we're doing is dangerous. Dangerous? He looked at me with total bafflement. What do you mean, dangerous? I said, she thinks there's something down there. He shrugged impatiently. Of course there's something down there. The remains of the oldest civilization on earth. Haven't you explained? Yes, she understands that. Then what's worrying her? She says she has a feeling of evil. Evil? He stared at me blankly, and I realized that he didn't even begin to understand. I tried another approach. She says that if we go ahead, we'll be releasing a kind of genie from a bottle. I saw immediately that I'd said the right thing. As a scientist, he knew all about releasing genies from bottles. The atomic bomb, atmospheric pollution— destruction of the ozone layer. He thought for a moment, then said, Do you know what she means? I decided to duck that question. There was no point at this stage in trying to tell him the truth. No, sir. All right. Bring her to lunch, and I'll ask her myself. But when I told Inga, she shook her head. I don't want to go. I knew there was no point in trying to persuade her— I could sense that the thought of talking about it filled her with anxiety and insecurity. I said, I'll tell him you're asleep. To my relief, there was no need to lie. When I joined Trask in the dining room, he was looking unexpectedly buoyant, and when I told him Inga didn't feel hungry, he merely nodded. It was obvious that his incorrigibly active mind had already moved on to other things. As soon as I sat down opposite him— with my frankfurters and chips, he said, I've been a fool. We should have brought that girl with us in the first place. Yes? I wondered what he was talking about. She could have told us where to start. She can sense what's under the ice. Now I understood. Trask had seen her locate coins hidden under cups, and perform various other feats of extrasensory perception. He now went on to tell me, how a dowser had led him to the site of one of the biggest oil finds in the Midwest. It was still financing his researches. Windy Gap was basically a glacier, a slow-moving torrent of ice. The parts of a glacier move at different velocities, the center moving fastest. If there was a city under the ice, then it had probably been torn apart. We might spend another three weeks getting down to the floor of the valley— and then find nothing. What Trask was hoping was that Inga could tell us if we were wasting our time. Do you think she'll feel well enough to come along this afternoon? The thought made my heart sink, but I said, I'll go and see how she's feeling. Inga was asleep when I got back. As I peeped in the door, she woke up, then sat up in bed, rubbing her eyes, and looking so pale that I hardly had the heart to tell her why I'd come. But as I sat by her bed, wondering how to begin, she said, I know. Dr. Trask wants me to come. I had forgotten she had flashes of telepathy. How do you feel about it? She gave a faint shrug. Since he has brought me all this way, I cannot refuse. I had an idea. Why don't you and I go ahead and take a look at the place? I'll see if I can borrow the snowbeel. The snowbeel was a cross between a sled and a miniature tractor, used for carrying small loads around the camp. Dave Eng was using it to move frozen food when I located it, but he let me take it. I had never driven it before, but it was simple enough. 
wheels with snow tyres projected only a few inches below sled runners, so that if the snow was unexpectedly deep, it could not sink in. It worked off long-life batteries, and made a high, whining noise. Both wrapped up to the eyebrows, we set out at twelve miles an hour, about the speed of a bicycle, following the tracks of the snow tractor. The vehicle bumped and rolled, throwing us both from side to side, but it didn't bother me. I had a watery feeling of foreboding in the pit of my stomach, and the bumps were a welcome distraction. It was a calm, bright afternoon with a clear sky, and the wind had dropped. I braked the snowmobile within a few feet of the edge of the trench. This now extended about halfway across the valley, being roughly three hundred feet deep at the north cliff face. At the far end it was merely a ramp sloping down into the trench. The chief danger, obviously, was that the snow tractor would slide down the ramp and end up at the bottom of the hole, so the slope had been made very gentle. I anticipated that, by the time the hole was half a mile deep, the trench would have to extend right across the valley. We walked across and looked down into the hole, a terrifying sight. The thought of what it would look like when it was six times as deep made me feel dizzy. I looked at Inga and was shocked by her paleness. Are you all right? I would like to sit down. We went back to the snowbeel, and she almost collapsed into the passenger seat. She sat with her eyes closed, looking very ill. Shall I take you back? She shook her head, then rested it on the back of the seat. I sat beside her, afraid to speak. Finally, she opened her eyes. What is it? She said, this place tastes of death. Death? That startled me. Can you not feel it? I looked at the white snow, glittering in the sun that lay behind us, and shook my head. To me it looked bleak, but rather beautiful. She said, Take off your gloves. Wondering what it was all about, I did as she said. She slipped off her own fur gloves, then made me turn toward her, and took both my hands. Suddenly, I understood. I had been making the obvious mistake, looking at the landscape and trying to imagine what lay below it. I should have been looking inside myself. As soon as she took my hands, the watery feeling in my stomach increased and turned into something like nausea. At the same time, I became aware of something like a very unpleasant smell— the most horrible smell that I have ever encountered in my life. I say something like, because I was perfectly aware that it existed only in my own mind. I knew that, physically speaking, I was breathing in the new leather smell of the snowbeel, and the joint of smoked bacon that Dave Eng had been carrying in the passenger seat when I had borrowed the vehicle. The other smell was somehow inside me, like an unpleasant memory that was so clear that merely thinking about it made it come back. It was like rotting flesh, but far more nauseating. So nauseating that I knew that if I gave way to the temptation to cough, I would end up being sick. Then I began to understand what Inga meant about the taste of death. This whole valley seemed to be full of it, an appalling sensation of cruelty and evil. Something horrible had taken place here, not once, but many times. The sensation became so sickening that I had to let go of her hands. It was rather like turning your face away from an accident with a gruesomely mutilated corpse. Even then, it persisted for perhaps half a minute before it slowly faded. Now I understood why Inga looked so pale. She had been aware of this ever since she had arrived— there was no point in turning away from it. I wanted to understand it. So I suppressed the queasiness in my stomach, and reached out and took her hands again. Now it was not merely the smell that I was aware of, but the cruelty. This is what was so frightening. It brought back an afternoon when I was in fifth grade, when we had been studying Christopher Marlowe's Tamburlaine and I had been sufficiently curious to go and look him up in the library. Tamburlaine had been a Mongol, a descendant of Genghis Khan, 
and he was an insane sadist. On one occasion, it had two thousand prisoners bricked alive into a living mound. On another, it had three thousand beheaded, and their heads built into a pyramid. The book gave me nightmares for weeks afterward. Now the nightmare seemed to come back, but amplified to a point that made me feel physically drained. Inga took her hands out of mine, but this time the nightmare refused to go away. I had tuned into it, and it was inescapable. I climbed out of the snowbeel to get some fresh air, knowing that for the rest of my life the smell of smoked bacon and new leather would bring back this nauseating odour of death. Now that I had braced myself against it, it was slightly more bearable, like looking at the remains of someone who has been torn apart in an accident, and realising that, after all, this is only dead flesh. But the stench remained appalling. I cannot describe this, but it might convey some idea if I say that it was like a combination of meat that has been allowed to go rotten, a public toilet that had not been cleaned for years— and an oddly sweet burning smell, like some kind of plastic. It now seemed incredible to me that I had ever been unable to smell it. I longed to get away from the place, but knew this was impossible. We had to wait for the snow tractor. So I began to walk across the valley toward its south side. This only made it worse. I tried walking back toward the camp, and this improved it slightly. The further I got from this place, the better it seemed to be. I was amused at the thought of how Lovecraft would have described all this. He would have said something like, My mind reeled into an abyss of blasphemous horror. In fact, it was not at all like that. What was so unpleasant about this place was not blasphemous horror, but just sheer nastiness. As my mind recovered its balance— I realized that there was no point in being sickened by it. In the long history of mankind, the earth has seen some appalling cruelty, yet man remains basically decent, and civilization goes on. We have to face it and move on from there. Inga came and joined me. The cold had brought a little color to her cheeks. I said, Well, what do you think of it? Of what? Are they digging in the right place? She looked down at the trench and said dryly, "'They will find what they are looking for.' It was odd that she could tell what lay under the ice. I asked, "'What's down there?' "'The remains of a city, and a graveyard under the city, but I think it contains more than graves.' There was no need to ask what she meant. As she spoke, even I could feel it. There was something down there, and it was aware of our presence.' It would have been pointless to ask whether it was benevolent or otherwise. Is an octopus lurking in an underwater cave benevolent, or a python lying along the branch of a tree? I suppose your attitude will depend on whether you happen to be something it likes for dinner. I pointed at the hole. What will they find down there? She frowned and lowered her eyes. It is some kind of science laboratory. An observatory? She looked at me with surprise. Yes, an observatory. I pointed across the valley. Why does it feel worse over there? She frowned and shook her head. I don't know. Come and see. 5. Walking toward the south side of the valley cost me an effort. I was soon reeling from the stench and tempted to hold my breath although I knew this would make no difference. Finally, I could go no further, and was forced to stand still. Well? Her face was also wrinkled with disgust. Yes, it is very bad. It is a place of torment. Torment? But she seemed unable or unwilling to elaborate. I mean, is it dangerous? To my surprise, she shook her head. No. I do not feel it is dangerous. And where is it? Where? At first, she did not seem to understand me. Is it under our feet? No, no, she pointed. It is down there, in the side of the mountain. 
She was indicating a place slightly to the north of where the landslide had happened. How far down? She considered, then said, perhaps a hundred feet. No more? No. Even now it was obvious that she had not grasped the significance of what she had said. I heard the sound of the snow tractor coming toward us. It was late. The time was now about half past three. I said, Will you tell him that? Yes. But she was obviously puzzled. A few moments later the tractor arrived, and Trask jumped down, wearing his tartan scarf and baseball cap. He explained that they had been delayed while he contacted Little America via satellite. Anything happening? I said, Ingus found something. Good. What? She thinks we've started in the wrong place. I left her to do the explaining. She pointed across the valley. You should have started there, Trask said. Why, what's there? There is something about a hundred feet down. I felt almost guilty at the look of delight that crossed his face. A hundred feet? What is it? I don't know. I can't tell. Some kind of a cave in the face of the cliff. Trask beamed at her, then at me. Then he turned to Bill Ruggles. Get that thing over there. Bill, who had not been close enough to hear the conversation, looked dismayed. Over there? You're going to start all over again? Trask nodded. That's right. Bill knew him well enough not to argue. Inger and I climbed into the snowbeel and followed the tractor. The centre of the valley had less compacted snow than the sides. The wind carried it away as soon as it settled, but the snowbeel was inclined to skid on the ice. The tractor stopped. Trask came back to the snowbeel. Tell us where it is. She got out and pointed. Somewhere down there. They turned the tractor and positioned it with the laser pointing at the face of the mountain, which at this point was almost vertical. While Inger and I watched from inside the snowbeel, Trask got into the trailer and helped Bill and Elmo adjust the angle of the laser. She stared with a kind of horrified fascination as the ruby beam stabbed into the ice like a spear and steam hissed into the air. The breeze carried it away up the valley, but now there was far less steam, for Trask was directing the beam at an angle of about forty-five degrees, so it cut down through the ice, which then collapsed on top of it, and was in turn dissolved away. The method was sensible. The superheated steam melted the ice above it, which in turn reduced the amount of steam. Instead of wasting the heat in the steam, Trask was putting it to practical use. The violent explosions of trapped steam hastened the process. It was good for me to concentrate on the laser. I noticed that it seemed to diminish the stench. After a few minutes, I worked out why this was. If I concentrated hard, narrowing my senses, it somehow decreased my sensitivity. Inga had made me open up to the psychic atmosphere of Windy Gap and if I wanted, I could close my mind again, by focusing my senses and exerting my will. This produced exactly the same effect as dissolving clouds, a sense of power behind the eyes. Inga's psychic powers were, of course, far greater than mine, but they had the disadvantage of being beyond her control. She could not close her mind as I could. At the same time, I could not open my mind as she could. When I tried it as I sat beside her, doing my best to relax into a state of receptivity, my mind seemed to jam like a door that refuses to open. This brought me an interesting insight. Ever since the Vasilevskys had taught me that I could dissolve clouds, I had experienced a wonderful sense of optimism and strength, the feeling that I had discovered a secret of which the rest of the human race is unaware the secret that we can make things happen. What I could not understand was why the Vasilevskys were unaware of it. After all, they had taught me. Now, sitting next to Inga, I saw the answer. Their powers were natural. They were born with them. So they took them for granted. I had discovered mine by accident. I was like a poor man who inherits a fortune, 
and who therefore feels far richer than a person who has been born rich. As I looked at Trask, supervising the operation in his baseball cap and tartan scarf, I saw that he was also in the position of someone who has been born rich. With his terrific energy and vitality and purpose, he used his secret powers quite automatically, without ever being aware that he was making things happen. Trask could have dissolved clouds if he wanted. Even then, I doubt whether he would have understood the secret. He would have thought it was some natural power that we happened to possess, and would probably have thought it was far less interesting than inventing a new kind of transistor. He would not have understood that it is the most important discovery that human beings can possibly make, a discovery that can enable them to take charge of their fate and become masters of reality. I had talked to Anton Voronsky, the man who had been testing Inga when I met her, about some of his experiments with psychic powers. I had remarked that it seemed to me amazing that most scientists refused to accept the existence of psychic powers like extrasensory perception and psychokinesis, when the laboratory evidence is overwhelming. Voronsky replied, That is because it is not strong enough. You see, most people only possess about two percent of psychic powers. I asked him to elaborate. Look, if I put two cards face downward on the table, and ask you to guess which one is the ace of spades, you will stand a fifty percent chance of guessing correctly. If I repeat the experiment a thousand times, you will guess correctly exactly five hundred times. So, if you make five hundred and twenty correct guesses, that proves that you possess ESP. But that is not going to convince the skeptics. They will find some reason to dismiss it. Now, it is my experience that two percent is the average level of ESP. Most people have thought about their Aunt Mildred on the morning they receive a letter from her but they assume this is chance. They fail to realize that they are using their natural ESP. I now saw that Voronsky had handed me the vital clue. When you do something in a mood of happiness and expectation, it nearly always turns out right. That is because you are putting that extra two percent into it. You somehow know it's going to come out right. When a racing driver is in good form, he somehow knows he's not going to have an accident— Yet he doesn't realize that he is using his two percent of secret powers, the same powers I use to dissolve clouds. As I thought about this, I began to feel a marvelous sense of happiness and optimism. I saw that I had stumbled on the answer to the most important problems of human existence. People don't realize they possess hidden powers— just as a few centuries ago, they didn't realize that the blood circulates around the body. When we are accident-prone and things keep going wrong, we don't realize that we are making them go wrong by making negative use of hidden powers. If the whole human race understood about these hidden powers, man would become a completely different kind of creature, a kind of superman. At this point— I was brought back to the present by a billowing cloud of steam that surrounded us and plunged us into a kind of white darkness. When it cleared, I saw the laser had stopped working. I walked over to the trailer to see what was happening, and, as I expected, found that the crystal had shattered. For some reason, its power always increased before it burned out, rather like a faulty fuse. I also took the opportunity— to look down into the hole. It was only about twenty feet wide, but already more than sixty feet deep. The rock of the cliff face had fused into a shiny blue color where the laser had struck it. The ice sloped down to the cliff face at an angle of about thirty degrees, and the bottom of the wedge-shaped hole was full of steaming water. I spoke to Trask, but he didn't even hear me. He was so absorbed in what he was doing, that he was totally oblivious to the outside world. I sensed that nothing would distract him, until he had found what he was looking for. Back in the snowbile, the heater made it oppressively warm. I asked Inga, "'Would you like to go back?' She shook her head. "'No. I want to see what they find. 
It may be hours, or perhaps even tomorrow. But I knew it wouldn't be tomorrow. When Trask got the bit between his teeth, he didn't give up until he got what he wanted. The new ruby cylinder was unusually powerful. Once again we were enveloped in a cloud of steam that left the windshield covered in drops. What do you think they're going to find? She shook her head. I don't know. I reached out and took both her hands in mine. This immediately brought back the sickening stench. I found it hard to understand how she could stand it. The sense of evil and cruelty was overpowering. It felt like being trapped in a nightmare. I asked her, Have you ever known anything like this before? Yes. I once visited Babi Yar, where the Jews were murdered in the war. That was a little like this, but not as bad. Was there the same smell? No, just the smell of fear and misery. What was troubling me was who had died. The old ones, or the Shoggoths, or both. Whichever it was, I could sense great hatred as well as cruelty. This battle had been long and bitter, yet I found it impossible to believe that the old ones were capable of cruelty. To try to escape this sense of struggling in a nightmare, I let go of her hands and concentrated my mind until, as abruptly as a bursting bubble, the feeling of helplessness suddenly vanished. The relief was enormous. Able to think clearly once again, I began to reflect on the problem. If I'd been in a bottle for a long time, what would I want to do when I got out? I would begin by thanking those who had released me, and find out what I could do for them. I would want to try and understand them, and make them understand me. Or would I? I recalled my image of a human being towering above a mouse. How would I feel in a world of intelligent mice? The answer, I had to admit, was probably rather bored. Grateful and benevolent, perhaps, but bored. That was a disturbing thought. The next one was even more so. It struck me that whenever civilized man has discovered a simpler, more primitive society, he has destroyed it. I am not now speaking about the Spaniards who invaded Mexico and enslaved the Aztecs, or the Americans who drove the Indians off their ancestral lands, but even the modern students of anthropology, who have discovered unknown tribes in the heart of Borneo or Sumatra, for all their good intentions, all their determination not to impose their civilized values on the natives, they have always devastated the culture they were trying to preserve, just as surely as the early European explorers decimated the Maoris of New Zealand by bringing smallpox. The old ones might be entirely benevolent, but could they avoid bringing disasters on the human race, merely by being more powerful and intelligent? With a sinking feeling, I suddenly realized that that reflection changed the whole perspective of what we were doing. To shake off these doubts and perplexities, I went to see how the work was progressing. They had pulled back the tractor to cut into the ice at a less steep angle, but even so, it was now at least forty-five degrees. Elmo, who was now controlling the laser, would point it at the bottom of the slope, releasing a hissing cloud of steam and a shower of sparks as it struck the cliff face. Then, when the hole had been deepened by ten feet or so, he would concentrate on the ice of the slope, cutting away its surface until it ran straight and level up to the cliff face. Then he would lower the angle of the laser, and cut another ten-foot hole. The problem, I could see, was that the slope would soon be approaching sixty degrees. When that happened, they would have to pull back again, and evaporate thousands of tons of ice in order to make it less steep. It was now nearly seven o'clock in the evening. At this rate it would take until midnight. I was about to turn back to the snowbeel when Elmo lowered the angle of the laser, and plunged us into an exceptionally choking cloud of fog. I paused, waiting for the sharp hiss and the shower of sparks, as the beam struck the cliff. But this time, there were no sparks. Yet from where I was standing, at the eastern edge of the hole, 
The steam seemed to be thicker than ever. I called out to Elmo to hold on. He switched off the beam, and as the vapor cleared, I saw that the laser had gouged deep into the cliff face, creating a cavity that looked as if it had been made by a huge dentist's drill. I ran back to the snowbeel, where Inga had fallen into a doze, and shook her. Come and look! I took her by the hand, and led her to the edge of the hole. Trask asked her, Is this what you meant? She shook her head, still dazed with sleep. I don't know. I think so, Elmo said. Shall I go down there? Even I could see that he would break his neck on the sheer slope of ice. Trask said, No, we'll have to get ropes. But Bill Ruggles had a better idea. If we move the laser to one side, we can cut grooves in the ice. This is what we did. The laser was taken to the eastern edge of the hole, so it pointed across the slope. Then it was turned down to a tenth of its power, and a series of parallel grooves were cut across the ice. It took half an hour, but finally we had a series of shallow trenches, between six inches to a foot deep, at intervals of a few yards. Trask was the first to lower himself over the edge. Elmo and Bill Ruggles followed. I saw that Inga was hesitating. Don't you want to see? She shook her head. I was too excited to stay with her, and followed the others. We should have spent more time cutting the grooves, although they prevented us from sliding like a toboggan to the bottom, and probably breaking both legs against the cliff. They were themselves as smooth as an ice rink, while the width of the ice in between them meant we landed in each one with a jarring crash that knocked the breath out of us. By the time I reached the bottom, my face was scratched, and I had lost both gloves. The others were peering into the hole, which was six feet wide and perhaps ten feet deep. It was difficult to tell whether it was a cave or merely a kind of hollow in the cliff face. Trask finally gave orders to return to the top, a scramble that was worse than the one coming down. At least I recovered my gloves on the way. Trask told Elmo to deepen the hollow with a low power beam, and to widen it at the same time. Ten minutes later, the steam cleared to reveal a projecting ledge, and we knew that we had found a cave. I must admit that I was tired. My lack of sleep was catching up with me. Inga seemed oddly listless and indifferent, but Trask was obviously driven like a demon by a tremendous suppressed excitement. If we had all insisted on returning to camp, he would have continued alone. Once again we scrambled down the slope. Bill Ruggles made this part of the task easier by producing ice axes with spikes on the back that bit into the ice. The last twenty feet or so were the most dangerous, since it involved dropping down onto the ledge. It would have been safer to leave it until morning. We were all too tired to pay proper attention to safety, but no one would have dared to suggest it. Finally, we all stood in the cave entrance. The roof stretched high above us, about twenty-five feet, and the ice had been melted to a depth of perhaps a dozen yards. It was extremely dark, since we were at the bottom of a hole, and a downward sloping wall of ice still blocked the cave. We all had the same thought, that perhaps after all this effort, we had merely found an empty cave that had filled up with water and then frozen. Then Elmo gave a shout. He was shining his torch in the ice to the right of the cave, and embedded in it, at a depth of a few feet, there was an object that looked like some kind of artifact. Trask shone his powerful light on it. The ice was as clear as glass, and gave a chuckle of satisfaction. What we were looking at was an axe head, an enormous axe head, about three feet across. Bill and Elmo used their ice axes to chop their way into it. When it had been freed and dragged into the cave entrance, we could see that it was big enough to poleaxe a mammoth. The surface was blackened, so it was impossible to tell what kind of metal it was made from, but its sheer weight 
suggested iron or bronze. Moreover, on the far side of the hole that had once held the haft, there was a broken surface, as if this had once been a double-headed axe, like the ones found at the palace of Minas in Crete. As we looked down on it, we all recognized that we had made one of the major archaeological discoveries of the century. It was one of those moments when a shared emotion seems to unite a group with a kind of telepathy. Bill said, "'Congratulations, Dr. Trask. You've done it again.' Trask smiled modestly. "'Only with your help.' He looked around him. "'I think this deserves to be called the Cave of the Giants.' While Bill took a photograph of Trask and Elmo with the axe head propped up between them, I picked up Trask's torch and went to investigate. Since the laser had cut down at an angle, the face of the ice sloped backward, forming a miniature cave about eight feet deep. I crawled into this and shone the torch into the clear ice. Although it was difficult to be sure, I had the impression that I was looking through a wall of ice— when the torch was moved, the light seemed to be reflected off another surface a few feet away. I called Trask and handed him the torch. He shone it through the ice, and confirmed my impression that only a few feet of ice divided us from the inside of the cave. The simplest method of gaining access would have been the laser, but unfortunately it had already reached its limit— we were going to have to lower it by several feet to enable it to reach deeper into the cave. To do this, we would need more manpower, and Trask called the camp on his radio to tell Chet Morrison to join us. Meanwhile, Elmo began cautiously hacking into the ice just above floor level, in case he caused the ice above to collapse. If it had, it would have squashed him like a fly. Bill and I removed the chunks of fallen ice by hand. When it became clear that the ice was stable, Bill and I joined in. Up above us, Trask and Chet Morrison were using the laser to create a slope leading down to the ramp, but it was going to be a long, slow business. Then, as all three of us hacked into the ice, it began to look as if the laser would be unnecessary. We had created a tunnel about six feet high at its entrance, and six feet wide, some of the chunks of ice we brought down weighed more than a hundred weight. Our blows had made the ice opaque, so we could no longer calculate how far we had to go. But we all knew it could not be far, and chopped away with increasing energy, each hoping to be the first to break through. In fact, it was Elmo. A tremendous underhand blow caused a hole to appear just above the height of the floor. We all began to cheer and laugh aloud. Trask called down to ask what had happened, and when we told him, came scrambling down at a dangerous pace. By that time, a few more blows had enlarged the opening, until it was three feet across. Bill leaned in and shone his torch, then came staggering back. God, it stinks! As the nauseating stench came filtering out, we all fell back to the mouth of the cave, where there was clean air. Chet Morrison began to retch. I was the first to recover. Since I had been smelling it most of the afternoon, I was already more or less accustomed to it. Besides, this stench was by no means as foul as it had been when Inger had first held my hands. This might have been nothing worse than an unclean butcher's shop, in which the blood had turned putrescent. I picked up Elmo's torch, went back to the hole— and shone it through. The powerful beam shone on the rear wall of the cave, about fifty yards away, then on something that looked like animal carcasses piled against it. I stayed there for several minutes, playing the torch around the cave's interior, then decided it was safe to climb in through the hole. Controlling my nausea by concentrating, I took a few steps across the level floor. Trask's voice said, my God, what are they? His own light shone over the carcasses. I already knew the answer to his question. I think they're called Shoggoths. He climbed in through the hole. How do you know? Lovecraft wrote about them. Lovecraft? He had obviously never heard the name. Who is he? 
a writer who had nightmares. Trask was advancing across the floor, and I admired his courage. These things filled me with the same sense of nastiness that I had experienced earlier in the day, and I felt no desire to approach any closer. Finally, shame led me to suppress my revulsion and follow Trask. He asked, But what are they? Frankenstein's monsters. Oh, nonsense! Then his voice trailed away. He was looking down at one of the carcasses that lay halfway across the floor. It was headless, and one of its upper limbs was missing. The limb was lying nearby on the floor. A shogoth is almost impossible to describe, since it lacks the symmetry of a human body. They are big, and even without a head, this one was twelve feet tall. It had six limbs, the lower one squat and powerful, like a caricature of an ape, the upper ones long and sinuous, more like tentacles. But the tentacles also had smaller tentacles, giving them the appearance of some kind of root. The whole body had a disorganized, lumpy appearance, like some grotesque potato that bears only a freak resemblance to a human being. I bent down and touched the grey-green flesh. I expected it to be frozen solid, like a carcass in a butcher's freezer, but it yielded slightly under my finger, like some kind of leather or plastic. This was clearly quite unlike human or animal flesh, and I recalled Lieber's comment that the Shoggoths were made of a mixture of animal and vegetable matter. The substance that had leaked out of the severed neck looked like yellow pus. Elmo startled us by shouting, "'You'd better come out! This ice is cracking!' But before we could even start to move, it had happened. The immense block of ice above the cave entrance came crashing down, shaking the whole cave. Our blows had weakened its hold on the roof above, and we were lucky it had not collapsed at the time. As far as Trask and I were concerned, this made no real difference. We were in no danger. No doubt we could have clambered up over the ice and crawled through the gap at the top. But that would have been both dangerous and pointless, since we merely had to wait for the laser to free us in due course. Bill Ruggles shouted to ask if we were all right. Trask called, "'We're fine. Just get us out when you're ready.' Then he turned his attention back to the corpse. What is it? A kind of abominable snowman? As far as I know, it's a kind of artifact. You could say it's a robot. You mean it was never alive? I had to admit, I'm afraid I just don't know the answer to that. Trask was advancing to the back of the cave. We passed what looked like two more bodies, then realized it was one body that had been torn in half. This Shoggoth was immense— it must have originally been twenty feet tall. It had a head, a kind of bulbous mound rising out of humped shoulders, and it also had eyes, a series of yellowish globes that ran around the mid-part of the head. These seemed to have eyelids both at the bottom and the top, and most of them were closed. As far as I could tell, there was no mouth— and the only thing that looked like a nose was a hole just below the eyes. Strange entrails, like bunches of blue rope, projected from its upper half, and the lower half was correspondingly hollow. I found myself wondering what force could have torn such a huge creature in two, like a rag doll. Against the rear wall of the cave, there were at least two dozen carcasses. They lay in a tangle of limbs, as if they had been driven like leaves in some tremendous gale. It reminded me of a photograph I had once seen, of a pile of corpses in a German concentration camp at the end of World War II. Trask, his voice sounding incongruously brisk and businesslike, said, "'But if these were robots, who made them?' According to Lovecraft, the original inhabitants of the earth, the old ones— I was aware that it sounded absurd, and that under normal circumstances Trask would have wondered about my sanity, but faced with these grotesque carcasses, I could see that he would have believed me if I had told him they were Martians. 
The strangest thing about the Shoggoths was that they were all unlike. Every one of them was in some way different from the others. Some had barrel-shaped bodies, with the middle limbs growing out of the sides. Some were broad and flat, and had eyes like rectangular slits. One even had two heads. I felt that they resembled vegetables rather than animals, some kind of root vegetable, like a potato or rutabaga, or even a Jerusalem artichoke, with its knobbly and unpredictable appearance. In some, the lower limbs even looked like roots, tapering to a point. I had the impression that these things had been created almost arbitrarily, like Play-Doh figures moulded by a child. Trask asked, How do you think they died? To me, the answer seemed obvious. I think they were killed by the old ones. Any idea why? I had the feeling that he felt compelled to go on asking me questions, even though he knew I could only guess at the answers. In this case, though, I knew the answer. Because they were in revolt. And where are these old ones now? I pointed downward. Somewhere down there, under half a mile of ice. It took him some time to absorb this. I could see he was stunned, and could imagine what he was feeling. He had expected to discover the remains of a maritime civilization dating from about 7,000 BC. Instead, he was looking at the remains of a tragedy that had taken place before Homo sapiens appeared on Earth. He asked finally, How long have you known about all this? The old ones? Ever since we came here. How did you know? This was no time or place to explain. So I said, I just felt their presence. And Inga? Yes. She can also feel them. Again he was silent. He said finally, How do you think these old ones died? It seemed pointless not to be honest with him. I don't believe they are dead. Not dead? He was not as startled as I expected, or perhaps he simply had more self-control. How can that be? Don't forget these things are not human. I pointed at the carcasses. Like these things. Yes, but nothing could remain alive under half a mile of ice. Some fishes do. That's merely for the winter. Nothing could live for thousands of years. It contradicts all the laws of nature." I nodded at the carcasses, but so do these. He shook his head. That simply does not follow. What you say is not logical. I observed a tone of irritability, and decided not to contradict him. Instead, I tried to turn it into a joke. I think I'm going to freeze if I stay in here much longer. The cave was like a refrigerator. It had been cold outside, but the sun and the steam from the ice had kept the temperature around freezing point. In here, it must have been twenty below, and we had already been trapped there for about half an hour. Trask went to the debris of fallen ice that blocked the entrance, and called, "'Anything happening there?' Elmo's voice came back. "'They're nearly ready. You'd better stand well back.' We retreated to the rear of the cave, and stood against the wall. One of the creatures— which had lost two of its limbs, lay a few feet away from us, the yellow pus-like substance forming a pool around its body, like a melted ice cream. I noted between its lower limbs, which were sprawled apart, a gaping hole that seemed to be surrounded by thicker flesh, like a mouth, while inside there were a few elongated white spines that looked as if they might be teeth. I pointed it out to Trask, who knelt beside it, and shone his torch into it. Yes, it seems to be some kind of mouth. I wonder if these things gave rise to the legend of troglodytes. It struck me as ironic that, after half an hour, we were both taking these creatures for granted, when the first sight of them had been such a shock. As I stood there in the semi-darkness, one thing suddenly became clear to me. These twisted carcasses— Explain the sense of evil that Ingrid felt as soon as she arrived. I could imagine the same kind of butchery taking place all over the valley, Shoggoths being slaughtered like cattle, 
but with a deliberate cruelty that sprang from rage and vindictiveness. In that moment of insight, I was also forced to face the truth that I had been trying to ignore since Ingrid had taken my hands— that the old ones were not the wise, benevolent creatures I had assumed, and that Lovecraft had come to believe they were. They were capable of the same kind of brutal ferocity and sadism that had shocked me when I read about Tamburlaine. Perhaps, of course, it had been justified. Perhaps the Shoggoths had treated them in the same way. But looking at these horribly mutilated corpses, one thing was clear— that the old ones were monsters. A hissing sound told us that the laser had been activated. They must have been using it on low power, otherwise the beam would have cut straight through the ice. What happened now was that the ice was suddenly illuminated from inside, as if by a red sunset, then began to collapse. At that point, the cave filled with steam. We both began to cough. Then the laser turned off. Elmo's voice called, "'Are you okay?' We both shouted yes. Moments later, the ice reddened again, and more steam surged around us. It was by no means an unpleasant sensation, for we had both been frozen to the bone, and the steam turned the cave into something like a sauna. I noticed water flowing across the floor, then my feet began to feel warm. I knelt and put my finger in it, then snatched it away. The water was near boiling point. I looked around for something to stand on, but there were no ledges or fallen rocks. Reluctantly, I clambered onto the nearest body and felt rubbery flesh yielding under my boots. I almost fell and had to lean back against the wall of the cave. The steam made it impossible to see what Trask was doing. Elmo shouted, "'Are you all right?' Trask's voice called, "'Yes, just once more.' I noticed that the stench of rotting flesh had suddenly increased, and I felt my boots sink into the body underneath me. At that point I realized that it had no bones. The Shoggoths, like the old ones, were a kind of mollusk. Again, the cave filled with hissing steam, this time far more of it. Another wave of hot water flooded across the floor. Then Elmo's voice, suddenly clear, shouted, "'Where are you?' We heard his footsteps splashing through the water. I shouted, "'Be careful!' It had suddenly struck me that he might stumble into one of the Shoggoths, and that it would be an extremely unpleasant shock. A moment later, I knew it had happened." Elmo gave one of the most appalling screams I had ever heard. To my right, Trask sounded as if he were choking. I called, Dr. Trask, but there was no reply. I decided I'd better go and see what was happening. But as I tried to climb off the Shoggoth, I felt something grip my ankle. I looked down and saw that a tentacle was winding around my leg— and that the yellow eyes of the creature I'd been standing on were staring up at me. At that point I also began to scream, and to kick out frantically. I yelled even louder, as another tentacle wound around the other leg, gripping with frightening strength. I bent down, and struck out with a torch at one of the yellow eyes. It squelched like jelly, and as one tentacle released me, I fell sideways, tearing my other leg free, and ran for the door. In my panic, I cannoned into somebody, perhaps Elmo, and kept on running until I tripped and fell heavily onto the ice outside the cave. I was scrambling to my feet when I realized that Bill Ruggles was blocking my path. When he asked, Where's Dr. Trask? I pointed frantically behind me. As Bill ran into the cave, shouting Trask's name, I was suddenly ashamed of my panic and went after him. Then I saw why Trask was not answering. He was being gripped by a tentacle that had wound around his neck, and his face was purple. All around him, the mass of Shoggoths was heaving and struggling like a giant heap of maggots, as if those underneath were trying to push their way out. Even the Shoggoth that had been torn into two halves seemed to be moving, 
and the headless one was crawling on all fours. Incredibly, the severed limb was writhing like a blind snake. I saw Bill slash with his ice axe at a tentacle that wound itself around his ankle, then dropped the axe to grab the tentacle around Trask's throat with both hands. I ran forward to help him, seizing the fallen axe and hacking at a tentacle that had wound around his waist, and another that seized my leg. For a despairing moment, I had a sudden conviction that we were all going to die. Then, Bill was dragging Trask across the floor toward the cave mouth, and somebody was helping him, and I tore myself free, leaving a boot behind, and ran for the door, and sprinted up the slope toward the tractor, as if I were running downhill. Bill and Chet Morrison arrived moments later, dragging Trask under the armpits. In the confusion that followed, it was difficult to tell what was happening, except that Inga flung her arms around me, and then quickly let go, as she realized that I was covered from head to foot with a kind of yellow slime. The flash of the laser almost blinded me. I was standing within six inches of the end of the barrel, and another great cloud of steam hissed up to the sky. Elmo was pointing it toward the cave, and from the shower of sparks he must have turned up the beam to maximum strength. I sat down on the ground, my teeth chattering, suddenly feeling very weak. Inga was trying to pull me by the arm, shouting in my ear, "'You must come back!' But I shook my head. I just wanted to be left alone. It was impossible to see through the billowing steam, but I thought I saw one of the Shoggoths trying to climb up the slope, then dissolving like melting wax as the laser hit it. Then, to my bewilderment, Elmo raised the beam so it pointed up the mountain. I understood the reason only when an avalanche of snow and ice began to crash down into the valley. A piece of flying ice cut my cheek, and I suddenly accepted the wisdom of returning to the snowbeel. I tried to climb into the driver's seat, but Inga refused to let me, and took the wheel. Then, bumping and lurching, we drove up Windy Gap at a speed that made my head bang against the canvas roof. I was still shivering violently, and the foul smell of the slime was so disgusting in the restricted space that I had to fight against being sick. As soon as we stopped in front of my hut, I crawled out on all fours and vomited on the ice. Then I went and lay down on the floor of my hut, refusing all Inga's attempts to make me undress and climb into bed, and fell asleep. When I woke up, she had covered me with the eiderdown, and had placed a pillow under my cheek. My head was splitting apart, and I felt as if I had the worst hangover of my life. When I looked at my watch, I was amazed to see that it was eleven o'clock in the morning. The room was full of the horrible stench of the slime, and I pulled off my clothes and threw them outside the door. Everything in the camp seemed quiet, and there was no one around. I took a shower, scrubbing my hands and face to remove the slime, which had set into a kind of gelatin. It clogged up the shower outlet. Then I threw the pillow and eider down back on the bed, climbed in, and fell asleep again. Inga woke me up at five in the afternoon, with some coffee. I still felt oddly weak, as if I'd been poisoned, but I succeeded in drinking the coffee. At least the stench had decreased. I asked her, "'What's happening?' "'Nothing. But Dr. Trask is in bed. Is he all right?' "'Yes, but he cannot speak.' Trask, it seemed, had been vomiting all night, and was now asleep. It looked as if Bill Ruggles had been just in time. Trask had been unconscious when they dragged him out of the cave, and Chet had had to apply some kind of heart massage before he began to breathe normally. I said, What about the cave? It is sealed up. Did you see the things inside it? No, but I heard about them. Were they the old ones? I stared at her in amazement. The old ones? Of course not. They were their servants, the Shoggoths. 
Then I realized that she knew nothing about Lovecraft or the Shoggoths, and had to explain. It was as I explained that I suddenly began to understand. So far, I'd had no time to think about what it all meant. Now I found myself asking myself questions that had not struck me at the time, and realizing that the answers were even worse than I had suspected. I had not asked myself, for example, what the Shoggoths were doing in a cave nearly half a mile above the valley floor. Now I realized that it was a prison, a virtually inaccessible prison, with a sheer drop below and a sheer cliff face above. It could be reached by the old ones, because they possessed a kind of limpet-like base that was intended for clinging to rocks. But for the Shoggoths, it was escape-proof. Why should the old ones want to torture them? That answer only came to me later, as I lay awake in the middle of the night. The Shoggoths were virtually unkillable. Like worms and lizards and other primitive organisms, they could simply regrow damaged limbs or amputated parts. I now recalled that the Shoggoth who had been torn in half was taller than the others— it had obviously continued to grow, even after it was too badly damaged to repair itself. How could unkillable creatures be kept in a state of subjection, and, if necessary, punished? There was only one answer. By sheer cruelty. By inflicting hideous damage. I could not forget that, even after its head had been torn off, one Shoggoth remained alive. In that case, was it— Really cruelty? On reflection, I could not doubt it. These things must have had some ability to feel pain, since pain is a safety mechanism, without which a living creature would perish. To subdue their virtually indestructible creations, their masters had turned cruelty into a science. There was a price to pay. It is impossible to become an expert in inflicting pain without turning into a sadist. This is what had happened to the old ones. In their ruthless Darwinian world, there was no room for benevolence. The old ones slaughtered and tortured the Shoggoths, and the Shoggoths, when they got the opportunity, probably slaughtered and tortured the old ones. That was why the valley reeked of cruelty. That was also why the human race could never afford to release them. Nature had sealed them in a tomb of ice, and there they had to stay. If, at some future date, the polar ice cap shows signs of melting away, then our descendants will have to face the problem and make up their minds about whether to destroy them or establish some kind of cooperation. But the latest long-term projections suggest that the polar ice caps will remain frozen for at least another hundred thousand years. Perhaps by that time the old ones will no longer be the most intelligent creatures on Earth. Later that evening, I felt well enough to go to the dining room and eat a bowl of soup. After that, I went in to see Trask. He was sitting up in bed, and his face was covered with petechial hemorrhages. His voice was weak and hoarse, but I soon sensed that he was more vigorous than he looked. He began by reaching out and shaking my hand. I want to say thank you. For what? I was astonished. I was still feeling guilty about leaving him behind in the cave. You were right, and I was wrong. I said awkwardly, it's nice of you to say so. But I felt this was all a misunderstanding. Trask said, tomorrow we're all going back to Little America. Are you sure you're well enough? He shrugged impatiently. Of course, and I don't want to stay in this place an hour longer than I have to. But before we go— I am going to have to ask you to promise you'll keep silent. Of course. I mean really silent. With your father, your mother, your grandfather. You understand why. He went into a paroxysm of coughing, and I had to persuade him to stop talking. In any case, it was unnecessary for him to explain. I knew exactly what he meant to say. That if this leaked out, it would mean worldwide publicity— and worldwide curiosity. Within a year or two, perhaps sooner than that, there would be another expedition to Windy Gap, 
and this time they might let the genie out of the bottle. That, thank God, has not happened. Now, forty years later, Trask is dead. Elmo Yarnefelt has just died in Finland. Bill Ruggles is a retired multimillionaire. Dave Eng has bought a farm in Ohio, and Chet Morrison owns a fishing fleet in San Diego. And for the past ten years, Inger and I have lived in the apartment above the laboratory that used to belong to Trask before he married. Why do I tell this story when it might be best to keep silent? Because I need to explain how I could leave Windy Gap with a clear conscience. When, on that plane journey back to America, I told Trask about the old ones, he was appalled at the thought of leaving intelligent creatures trapped beneath the ice, perhaps for another million years. Yet when I had told him the whole story, he agreed that there is no alternative. The truth is that we had no right to make the decision to release them without first consulting the best minds, the keenest intelligences of our own race. And when they had considered the problem objectively, I believe that they would agree we made the right decision. For let us suppose for a moment that the old ones are the benevolent, trustworthy, kindly creatures I had assumed, and that we could trust them not to use their power and intelligence to enslave mankind. Try to imagine what would happen if we had released them, and they had indeed proved to be as wise and humane as I thought. By the law of superior vitality and dominance, they would soon have become the trusted advisers of mankind, and, in a short time, our rulers. We, of course, would be delighted to leave our worst social problems in their hands. All human beings long for a father figure, someone to advise and protect and look after them. There would be no more wars, crime would vanish, and the wealth of the earth would be distributed wisely and justly. But mankind would also have lost the gains of ten thousand years of evolution at a stroke, for evolution consists of the power to control ourselves, to govern ourselves, to take the consequences of our own actions. The aim of human evolution is for every individual to achieve a high degree of self-mastery. At present we are children, and our purpose is to grow up. This can only be done by taking responsibility, and above all by learning to concentrate. Dr. Johnson once remarked, The knowledge that he is to be hanged in a fortnight concentrates a man's mind wonderfully. I had learned that man possesses an unknown power, and that the key to unlocking this unknown power lies in concentration. You may reply that placing our practical problems in the hands of benevolent father figures would give us even more time to learn to concentrate. Unfortunately, this is not the way evolution operates. Human history has been virtually a non-stop crisis. Ice ages, floods, earthquakes, predators, wars— and he has achieved his present level of consciousness by continuous struggle. Without struggle and effort, man tends to slip into laziness and mediocrity. I am totally convinced that we are now on the point of an evolutionary leap to a higher phase, a phase in which we shall recognize that the power to control our own destiny lies in the mind itself, and the key to the unknown power lies literally behind our eyes. So even assuming the best possible scenario, in which the old ones prove to be benevolent and trustworthy, their introduction into the human story at this point would be a disaster. In effect, humankind would be back in the nursery. But having thought endlessly about those events of those last twenty-four hours in Windy Gap, I cannot believe that we would have been confronting this best possible scenario. In retrospect, it is clear that the old ones deceived me. They set out to convince me that they were kindly and benevolent creatures, far too intelligent to be capable of brutality or ruthlessness. The cave of the Shoggoths taught me otherwise, that they are as impatient and ruthless as any tyrant in human history, and that they react just as badly to any attempt to thwart their will. I believe that the human race would have come to hate the Old Ones just as much as the Shoggoths did. 
I also believe that the Old One sensed the coming change in human consciousness, and that it increased their sense of urgency. They wanted to escape before mankind grew beyond their control. Only chance and the arrival of Inga thwarted them. I believe, and Trask agreed with me, that the human race would be stupid to consider taking that risk again. We returned to find New York in the grip of the worst winter for twenty years. Yet in comparison with the South Pole, it seemed pleasantly mild. Strangely enough, no one ever showed the slightest curiosity about what had happened in Antarctica. Colonel Leroy accepted Trask's word that it had been a waste of time. Trask's shareholders accepted that he had failed to find oil, and the press did not even bother to try to interview us. The only loser, in retrospect, is Hapgood. His lost civilization still lies under the ice of Antarctica, and since his book has been out of print for over half a century, it seems unlikely that it will ever be found. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.